And welcome to For New Eyes Only, the James Bond retrospective podcast where I'm watching these movies for the first time. What's where up, everyone? Why you hide? <laughs> We're back. We're back in business, everyone. Holy howdy. Back with another Roger Moore Bond for you. Yes. I'm Josh. With me, as always, is the Q to my James Bond, Nathan Simmons. Nathan, how I, you been? I'm good, man. Uh, I am so thrilled to be doing this again. A uh, little, you know, a uh, little bit of table setting up top. It's been a minute since we've talked Bond. Yeah, yep. you and I have both had a bunch of different uh, personal projects we've been working on. Life gets crazy. Life is like a hurricane, as the DuckTales theme song once said. And uh, <laughs> it is so great to be back talking Bond. Is it great to be back talking Moonraker? We will see. <laughs> <laughs> I I, I want to go ahead and put the caveat out there as well. It's not uh, because it's not because Moonraker was the next Bond. Just it's like, the reason there it, was such done. a big gap. Uh, I, I kept waiting for someone in the comments to be like, "Are you guys just not coming back because it's Moonraker?" Like. <laughs> No, I was actually very, very uh, curious to see Moonraker mm -hmm. and because it has a reputation, which we are going to get into in our discussion tonight. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's just, you know, when you hear, you know, the worst Bond movies, this is definitely one of the ones that comes up in the conversation. I mean, it's it's the one that even Roger Moore has said, like one of the one of the ones Roger Moore has said he's like not particularly fond of. Um, yeah. When Die Another Day came out and that one was kind of being heralded as like the worst Bond Mm -hmm. uh he he said that you know he'd been to the premiere he's like i just think they went a little too far it was a little ridiculous and that's coming from me the first bond in space <laughs> <laughs> which is like one of my favorite quotes oh, more gosh. eminently quotable he was something else in the behind the scenes for this one it's it's uh, the same interview that he gives mm -hmm. for quite a few of the bond movies but he was just hitting those really deep Roger Moore talking yeah. notes and oh dear I, I was, old Cubby Broccoli and I <laughs> yeah. and uh he was just like yeah he, he he went on and on about all the shit that happened in this one <laughs> yeah and uh but yeah I mean this one again like the reputation I'm coming into these movies fresh not knowing anything about them Moonraker mm -hmm. was the one where I was like okay this is the one that I hear is going to be a hard, hard time and sat and watched this one with my wife and yeah. uh oh, I was tech texting you as yeah. we're as we usually do when we start watching these movies to talk about them and i just texted you at one point in the middle of the movie and i said jenny just said this is stupid it's <laughs> <laughs> not wrong i my my fiance which by the way i got engaged since the last time congratulations Thanks, yes man. uh my my fiance actually asked me at one point uh, who, she has not watched any bond films i think maybe she's seen part of casino royale uh mm -hmm. but asked me like do you want me to watch this one with you would that be fun or whatever because and i was like no i don't i like it was the, like you know how long i've waited for her to ask me can i watch a bond movie with you and then i just said absolutely not like i don't want this to be your first bond movie you're um, like can i take a rain check because i mean for for your eyes only is the next one so would you watch that one with me that's, that's almost exactly what i said i said i think you might like that one i also said after so after i watched the movie and and texted you back like yeah it's an interesting watch uh <laughs> so we're back with roger moore and i i told ashley um you know, I, I always say on the show, I'm a very big Roger Moore defender. I'm a fan. Mm -hmm. I love him as James Bond. And rewatching this movie was the first time that I asked myself, why? <laughs> <laughs> there were moments in this one where I was like, Roger Moore is not really giving it his all in this one. He's not. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's... <laughs> This is, I, I, we just need to go ahead and get into talking about it. Totally. Uh, Moon, Moonraker released 1979, directed by Lewis Gilbert. I believe mm. this is Lewis Gilbert's last one now? Yeah, I mean, after the success of, uh, of The Spy Who Loved Me, they were like, this guy can't miss. So let's have him come back and essentially remake that movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are actually things about Moonraker that I like more than the spy who loved me we'll get into that and i do i think we should say up front because we, we've front loaded this with a lot of snark 
this is not going to be a hate fest. There are things that no. I do enjoy about this movie as well. Right. The, I, I, the worst Bond movie is still a day, a glorious day in the sun for me. <laughs> while it while it was probably the roughest watch of a Bond movie for me so far, yeah. I, I can't say I hated the movie. Sure. It is entertaining to a point, but there was a lot of rolling my eyes and like, what the fuck was that? You know? Why did they movie? do this? Who thought this was a good idea? Yeah. Right. Right. And, you know, uh, the biggest the biggest point being is you hear a title like Moonraker. Mm -hmm. You see the poster for Moonraker. You see James Bond in space and you're like, wow, it takes an hour and a fucking half for him to get to space. It's the Jason goes to Manhattan. Uh, Jason takes Manhattan of the Bond films. Exactly. You know, I'm waiting this whole movie to just have this big space spectacle. And mm -hmm. it, I, you know, I get 20 minutes of it at the end of the movie and that's, yeah. that's the extent of it. And it's like, wow, and that's very, not what I was expecting at all. And in a, in a, in a set piece that very casually reveals that America has laser rifle technology <laughs> <laughs> just on deck at all times. <laughs> Well, I mean, I already brought up the success of The Spy Who Loved Me, mm -hmm. led into this one. We bring Lewis Gilbert back, and he says in the behind the scenes that they kind of wanted to get back to the comedy a little bit, sure. which I don't know if you would call what happens in this one comedy. <laughs> uh, but the, one thing I found super interesting about this mm -hmm. one in doing my research is budget of $34 million. Yeah. That is more than the first six Bond movies combined for yeah. a budget. This was a massive production that ultimately brought in a massive amount of money. I, I was blown away at how much money this movie huge had. hit. And this was like exactly the right time for it, which we'll, we'll talk about when we get into, into production. Um, Josh, do you want me to try to pitch you on the plot of Moonraker in 007 seconds or less? Only if you can do it in seven seconds or less. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Right here. Honestly, we were talking off mic. If, if, if Nathan can't summarize this one in seven seconds or less, <laughs> we've got a problem. Folks. I mean, I, I could have taken some of the stuff that I said for Spy Who Loved Me and just done a search and replace. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan, in three, two, one, go. After an experimental rocket is stolen, Bond investigates Hugo Drax and discovers a plot to wipe out humanity. 5.98 seconds. Nice. You're still in there, buddy. Still got it, baby. Yeah, and like like you said, it is an expensive production. It's this big, over-the-top story. I mean, I just told you that it is about the destruction of the human race. Mm. And would you believe me if I told you that the novel this is based on is one of the more, like, down to earth, straightforward spy craft novels that Fleming wrote. Yeah, I heard, you know, there's a there was a big thing at the end of, you know, at the end of all the Bond movies, they say James <laughs> Bond will be back at the end of Spy Who Loved Me. If anyone's paying attention, it says James Bond will be back in for your eyes only. Right. Didn't happen. Right. Uh, so they went back and they were like, oh, well, we've got Moonraker. We haven't done anything with that, which apparently Moonraker was supposed to be a movie before it was even written. I heard That's something right. about that. So it, it started. There was this long road to the big screen for Moonraker because Fleming had been uh, pitching this novel to a producer who wanted to buy the rights to live and let die and Fleming's then upcoming next novel, Moonraker. And okay. so sort of. Similarly to how Thunderball was, uh, you know, based on story notes for an unrealized James Bond project, Moonraker yep. was written with the express idea of becoming a film. And so I think that's why a lot of this book uh, is a lot of like Bond doing genuine detective work. Mm. It's mostly set in, you know, one region. There's not a whole lot of globe trotting. There's only a few, right? Which this movie is like every three scenes, we got to be somewhere else. Yeah. You talk about Bond movies being a travel log in our past yeah. episodes. This one is like King of the Hill, you know, oh my gosh. Like and the most tenuous reasons. And so in this book um it has actually one of my favorite opening scenes this is one of my favorite of the the bond novels genuinely uh, -huh. uh one of my favorite opening scenes is bond getting called into m's office and m asking him what do you know about hugo drax 
Uh-huh. You know, and Bond kind of doing his usual oh, lepidoptery. You know, he knows every like he stops just short of telling you this cat's social security number. Right. And like he he's like, oh, he's a wealthy industrialist. He's a war hero. He he had amnesia. He survived World War II and raised all this money for British defense. He's building this defense system. And uh and M's like, yeah, he's a great guy. I want you to investigate him. And Bond's <laughs> like, why? You know, you just said that he's like a good man. And he goes, sure. But here's the thing. I play bridge with Hugo Drax and he cheats. Like, wow. why? Why would this like good guy with, you know, this this uh, philanthropist, why would he even need to cheat at cards unless he just likes being devious? Like, it's yeah. kind of a brilliant moment. And so most of the book is Bond investigating Hugo Drax, who turns out to be a uh, a Nazi spy who escaped the end of World War Two and wow. uh, passed himself off as an amnesiac British war hero. And uh, the 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 Bond girl of this one is named Gala Brand, which is sort of like a fun little posh play on, you know, like it's it feels like a posh character name. It's not Holly Goodhead. Yeah, you know? it's 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 very much better than the one they go with on this one. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so but so what's wild is so if it's 1955, which is when this was being pitched and you're working with a budget lower than that of the original Dr. No. And then this clever little mystery story involving rockets seems like a slam dunk idea, right? You're like either right. going to adapt this or live and let die or Casino Royale. But if you're Eon Productions in 1979 and you've already <laughs> had Bond infiltrate a volcano base with a ninja army, he's already defeated two supervillains under the ocean. He's battled against a uh, an omnipotent voodoo priest and <laughs> Star Wars has just come out. You're looking at that title and you're like, fuck this novel. We got to get James up there and have him rake that moon himself. <laughs> you... you, you. <laughs> I just envisioned in my head, we ain't found shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you you bring up the two words that I was about to go to myself, and mm-hmm. that is Star Wars. Star Wars. Uh, you know, killed at the box office. So, of course, yeah. they're like, we've got to jump on this bandwagon. And Star, I mean, Star Wars comes out the same year as The Spy Who Loved Me, right? Uh-huh. And so, yep. like, they, they're just like, well, this is like eating our lunch right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, Star Wars Moonraker is not uh, (laughs) as much as it wants to be, for sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all of the things you said about Hugo Drax, I find really interesting. Yeah. Far more interesting than the Hugo Drax we get in this movie. Well, and it doesn't help that, like... Hugo Drax, in the novel, his plan is I'm going to use these stolen, I'm going to use these uh, rockets that I've developed for the British defense system Mm -hmm. to bomb London. And he's been playing the stock market so that he will get this huge payout when London is destroyed. Um, And in this movie, he essentially has the same plot as uh, Stromberg from The Spy Who Loved Me. I'm going to destroy the Earth and yep. repopulate with my with my people, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or, or, you know, create a new world, uh, you know, elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> and so we, we sort of get this movie that like we talked about James Bond's greatest hits last time. And it feels even more egregious in this one because so much of this movie feels like it's copying the beats from the previous film plus Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, even as much as when you get into the opening scene of this movie, the opening action segment, it's like, you know, we've got another bond with a parachute deal yeah. going on. Now, we've also always talked about how much these Bond movies inspire movies that we've seen in our lives. And yeah, totally. You know, for the first time ever, I'm realizing that Bond inspired Point Break. <laughs> 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 absolutely you know i was you know when, when point break is one of my like one of my top like bad good movies one you of know? your guiding stars yeah for for sure i'll be talking about it uh, in depth coming up here in the near future um, oh yeah but you know i would always thought that that skydiving scene in that was like oh man i've never seen anybody do this before yeah well if i were to watch james bond i definitely would have seen it before <laughs> it's this is a great opening scene and I I'm going to say, well, I have, I'm of two minds about this, right? So we open with the jet transporting the Moonraker shuttle. We got the two saboteurs in sick ass leather jackets, waking up, stealing it and burning everyone in the cockpit in a pretty spectacular bit. 
Yeah, yeah. And uh, when, when this opens up and you see that these guys are hiding in the compartments, I'm like, <laughs> somebody didn't do their security check because this, you know is, what? Way, this was way too easy. Not do their jobs for this to happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, we get our classic, you know, M checking in on Money Penny is 007 back from that African job. Well, he's on his last leg. Last or, leg. Um, and, I want to go ahead and say, yeah. you know, that is the beginning of Bond's uh, escapades with women in this one. I will go ahead and say now, this is one of the horniest Bonds I've ever seen in this He's movie. He's so horny, and it's so unnecessary. It's more, un it feels more unnecessary than usual in this one. Like, I mean, there's, there's, li there's literally a character in the middle of the movie that is there for him to fuck and then be done with. Yeah, at least she doesn't die this time. We'll, we'll talk True. about her coming up. All, but, <laughs> almost yeah. dies, but almost. does not die. <laughs> I was, I was shocked because in my memory, I was like, oh yeah, this is the, this is the, the disposable <laughs> Bond girl in the middle of the film that we keep getting. Um, but no, we, we, I love this opening sequence on the jet, although I have no clue what this mission is. I guess we don't really need to know, but no. uh, we've got we've got this private jet bonds making out with a flight attendant. And it turns out the flight attendant and the pilot are both bad guys. Yeah. And they're going to make him jump from the plane without a parachute, which is when we get the reveal that also our boy Jaws is back. Yep. And that was something that I wasn't expecting because... Yeah. Uh, you know, again, first time watch of all of these movies. You know, we talked about Jaws in the last episode. Um, it was very similar to Baron Samity at the end of Live and Let sure, Die. Like, yeah. you, you're you're told that this villain is going to live on and and possibly be an issue in the in the in future movies. And sure enough, we get some Jaws back in this one. But at this I, point, we've had Baron Samity and Nick Knack and a couple others survive their movies. Yep. This is the first time that they've followed through on it because Jaws was a huge hit with audiences. That's what I that's what I was in my research. I found out that a lot of people really liked Jaws. Mm -hmm. They shot two different endings, one where he died and one where right. he was alive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Lewis Gilbert was talking about this in the behind the scenes, how they got letters from young kids yeah. that were like, we like Jaws. We like Jaws. Why is Jaws a bad guy? I it's it, the, the specific phrasing he used. It was something like, why can't he be a goodie instead of a baddie? Which, yeah. I, <laughs> which I love so much. Um, and also Roger Moore became genuinely good friends with Richard Keel. They were friends until Keel passed away. Uh, like oh. they, like they, they kept in touch after both of these movies. And so there was like this sense of like, yeah, let's bring him back. Let's have some fun. Um, and I love that this movie <laughs> implies that there's like, a hinching service you can call. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my favorite scenes in this. Is when it's just like, you know, goons for hire is like, oh, you can get Jaws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Send that, that, send yeah. That guy. One of Drax's best moments is like, well, of course, if we can get him. <laughs> um, but this is a. I love this sequence. It took them eighty-eight skydives, I think, in order to get these shots. Um, there was a camera rig that they had to design yeah. specifically for these shots because the camera rigs were heavy. They were afraid that the uh, the people wearing the camera rigs with the parachutes would be injured or die right. because when the parachutes would go up, they could possibly break their necks. It was a they big had to, to build do. A like a specific parachute rig that was like a half inch thick or something like that to for for Bond's stunt actor uh, to wear so that. They could make it look like he didn't have one, but of course he needs one because he's yep. jumping out of a plane. Yeah, they, um, that was one of the biggest challenges with the actors was they yeah. had to be able to have a parachute that you could disguise mm -hmm. to where you would think nobody was wearing a parachute. It's so good. It's so well done. The fight is great. I love the guy who like just flies away into oblivion and <laughs> it's a little ruined for me. I love Jaws kind of flailing, like almost like he's like flapping his arms to try to get away. But mm -hmm. the weird animated cutout of Jaws that like falls into the title card is that was a question. A that was a question I wrote in my notes. How I wanted to ask you how yeah. you feel about the action sequence leading into the uh, opening titles in this one, because I think mm -hmm. it's pretty cheesy. Um, it is. Yeah. I'm not not crazy about it. While we're talking about Jaws, too, I'm not the biggest fan of Jaws in this movie. And we'll talk about that as we go through. Yeah. Um, I, 
I'm not a fan of his character trajectory, but I am a big fan of Richard Keel's performance in this movie. He's having a blast. I will yeah. give it that. He's definitely having a blast with the role. Yeah. I just think they definitely could have done something a little bit better with with Jaws and sure, this. totally. Um, oh, and but yeah, no, I I agree. I think this is not. I mean, it's hard to beat the last one with the Union Jack parachute leading us yeah. into the title card. This one. It just looks like something out of Batman 66. And I don't say that in a nice way. Like normally that's a compliment, <laughs> but like <laughs> I, uh, yeah, it just doesn't work for me. And it doesn't, I, apparently they did shoot a, a, a footage of him leaving the circus tent and like brushing himself off. And then they decided we're just going to make this more of a, uh, you know, a straight shot into the opening credits. It also doesn't help that, this song is a stinker. Yeah, I was not really happy with the song. And now no. in the opening credits, we'll talk about the post credit or the the credits in the, in the at the end of the movie. <laughs> um, but yeah, this opening song, I just find pretty flat. I, yeah. you know, we've expect, expressed our love for Shirley Bassey. We, oh, we have no, but like this one is just one of those like, Again, they're fitting the theme of the song with the title of the movie. And you're like, eh. putting Moonraker into the lyrics is so forced. And it's a weird thing because, yeah, we love we love Dame Shirley Bassey. Uh, this is one of the songs that, like, I can't even hum. You know what I mean? Like, I, yeah. I forget the I forget the lyrics. I forget the melody. And it's not really her fault. This was like a um, this was a last minute kind of recording. The. The. Uh, the original pitch was so uh, John Barry, the composer, writes this song with the great Paul Williams, a pop genius mm -hmm. who uh, they then pitched the song to Frank Sinatra to, to oh. sing. And so because he had made From Russia With Love like a big part of his act and like it's, right. it's Frankie, you know, we've already had Nancy. Why not get Frankie? Mm -hmm. uh, and depending on who you talk to, it was some kind of maybe a contractual dispute or a scheduling thing, but he couldn't do it. And right. so then they gave, they offered the song to Johnny Mathis, which could have been really cool. Johnny Mathis, again, depending on who you talk to, <laughs> either saw the lyrics and said, fuck this, I'm not interested, or <laughs> recorded it and nobody was like really happy with the final result. Um, so then they bring in Hal David, who wrote the lyrics to We Have All the Time in the World, mm -hmm. uh, to write new lyrics for Moonraker. And they offer the song to Kate Bush, who... <laughs> Had, yeah, who had just released her first album, The Kick Inside. Um, listeners, uh, viewers, everyone out there, Kate Bush is one of my favorite musicians of all time. Uh, <laughs> as a side note, my band, The Fever, The Rage, covered Kate Bush. Go check that out. Uh, our cover of uh, Running Up That Hill on whatever, you know, listening music listening platform you prefer. But yep. she... She turns it down because she is uh, about to embark on a tour. And uh -huh. it's crazy to me that they even thought about uh, <laughs> that. They even thought about having her record a song that they wrote when her first album has a song called James and the Cold Gun, which is a better <laughs> James Bond theme than like 50 percent of the actual James Bond themes <laughs> <laughs> like that chorus slaps. Um, and so finally, they're running out of time. And they call Shirley Bassey with like weeks to go before the film opens in theaters. And so she comes in, records the song. And because of the quick turnaround has never, never really felt like it was hers. Right. Um, has only ever performed it live like a handful of times, even though uh, Goldfinger and Diamonds Are Forever are like a staples in her set. Like Moonraker right. just doesn't really work for her. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, the song, the song's not great. I don't love these opening titles. Uh, a lot more girls on trampolines. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's where I'm starting to feel the monotony a little bit is like, OK, we're doing the same thing in the opening credits every time now. <laughs> yeah, let's let's find Except something a little shot, different. The one shot of like Boo Boo uh, Helen Slater, like flying through the opening titles, which is like <laughs> not great. Uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's I don't know. It, it's one of those things where whenever I watch this movie, I'm always really hype during this opening skydiving sequence. Yeah. And then we hit the song 
And I'm like, oh, right. This one's the one that feels kind of like it's going through the motions for a while. Yeah. And I mean, a- after the credits, you 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 get the, the, the normal Bond stuff. You get the right. at MI6. Let's talk about, you know, what your mission's going to be. Q's <laughs> going to give you some cool gadgets to have. Um, this is by far one of the, like, least gadget friendly movies i mean there's yeah, not a ton we get the watch one. um and we get our usual uh mi6 q branch walk through walk and talk scene which is fun which uh, that we'll, scene comes completely out of nowhere when you get insane. to it um but yeah i i like some of this like i love money penny laughing when bond says i fell out of an airplane without a shoot but yeah, yeah otherwise um is this is this the most that M has hated Bond? Yeah, I mean, I guess in the last movie, he's like, a lot of people want to kill you, Bond, including me. Right. Uh, but like, well, no, he just seems tired of Bond in this one. That's the point I wanted to kind of get to right off the bat in this one is, is you mm. kind of start here in the MI6 scene where it's like, I'm not feeling like Bernard Lee is giving me a whole lot of like, I hate mm-hmm. you, James. Uh, sure. This is like, it, it seems very just like monotone, this whole right. explanation of what, what the deal with the Moonraker shuttle and what he's going to be doing. Uh, no. Even even Q's exchange with the gadget is just like sort of like, oh, OK. Yeah. This is, got his and, gadget. and now this is when I do this usually. Yeah. Um, now, granted, uh, Bernard Lee wa- passed away very shortly after filming yeah. this movie, so he he wasn't in the best of health. Yeah. Um, a stomach cancer, I believe, is, is yeah, is, it's, uh, oh. it's, yeah. Um, he was supposed to come back for the next one, but unfortunately, he was just not well yeah. enough. I um, think they had his scenes scheduled to shoot. Yeah. And he wasn't, you know, he didn't have much to do in the movie, and then he ended up in the hospital before they could shoot anything, is what I read. Mm. Um, but yeah, I was sad to hear that. We do get a couple of really fun little withering comments from him. Like when Bond is testing out his like dart launcher on the wristwatch and it fires into the, the painting and he goes, oh, thank you, 007. Like, yeah. it's good stuff. It's uh, it's one of those where it's like he just seems like he's on he's on his last, you know, like I, I can't deal with this guy anymore. Like mm-hmm. I've expressed how much I hate Bond and, and you know, it's just what very little you get of the MI six people in this one is where it's just like, right. I'm not, I'm not feeling the, I'm not feeling the fun that you usually get with those scenes. I agree. In this one. I agree. And, and even, I, I don't know, we, we do get a little bit of sunshine when we're introduced to uh, Corinne Clary as Corinne DeFore. Yes. Uh, the, the, the helicopter pilot the, and Jack Jill of all trades for Hugo Drax. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I think I really enjoy her performance. I think she's I think she's more uh, compelling than our leading lady in this one. Uh, and I, I think she she's more compelling than some of the leading ladies we've seen so far. I agree. Yeah, um, she is. And, and unfortunately, we don't get much of her in this movie. Mm-mm. Um, but I, I am captivated by her from the moment she comes on screen. I mean, yeah. she's a very interesting character. She's also a true believer in Drax's whole deal, right? Like she right. thinks he's a good guy. You know, uh, Bond has that quip where they're flying out to Drax HQ. They see the mansion, which he's had every brick flown in from France. <laughs> and uh, Bond says, uh, you know, he owns a lot, doesn't he? And she says what he doesn't own, he doesn't want, <laughs> which is yeah. like tells us so much about this villain. Yep. Um, we, we, the phrase they use a few times is he's obsessed with the conquest of space, <laughs> which <laughs> it rules. <laughs> and he lives off of this compound, which is developing all of this space stuff. Uh, again, he's got not, astronaut ladies working out outside doing yeah. jazzercise. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was wondering how all that was going to play in and we get, our answer to that later in the movie, but mm. it's kind of odd to introduce all of these people, all of the astronauts that are going to be going out at the beginning. There's, um, there's so many scenes where he like gestures to two ladies and it's like, this is who these people are. Like at one point he's like, this is Mademoiselle de la and la Senorita del Mateo. And like, we like, as far as I can tell, it does not matter who they are. <laughs> no, no. And you learn at the end of the movie, they're only there to serve a purpose for his new world that he wants to create. As Bond calls it a stud farm in space, which yeah. is like an insane <laughs> line of dialogue. Um, um, and, and, and honestly, that's another thing I'll say as we go through this is like the one liners from Bond in this one are some of the weakest ever. Yeah. 
there's there is there's one that I love that is terrible, but <laughs> and and there is one that I think it we will get to it. I think Q has the best line in this movie, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's also terrible. I, I like this movie is really not good i don't know how to say it. Like, I, I think i'm just gonna come out and say it but like there's all this great build-up for drax and i think i think a lot of the problem i have with this movie is drax we get all this great build-up he's got this uh space program his privatized army he owns the eiffel tower there's this really <laughs> brilliant introductory bit where we see him at the piano playing for these two ladies to impress them the camera shows us that he's not really playing it yep. which is like such a brilliant character bit um and then i think i think it all falls apart because I think Michael Lonsdale is so boring in this movie. Yep. You mean you are already on the same page. <laughs> he is definitely like by far Hugo Drax least favorite foe we've had in a Bond movie. Which granted this was one of his earlier uh, English language performances mm -hmm. like English language films. Uh, you know, and, and folks might recognize him from stuff like Chariots of Fire. Uh, but like there, there's... <sighs> And, or he's also in Munich. He's great in Munich. But like, I, I, yeah, Hugo Drax, he's very, like you said, very monotone. He's, he's sort of what, like when you were describing your beef with um, Dr. No, who you've since come around on, mm -hmm. I think that this is actually closer to that. Like that it's just very, very dry and not dry in like a fun way. Right. This is, I had read, had a note about Dr. No. I was like, you know, this is the guy, if, 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 uh, um, if Blofeld wasn't interesting, uh, yeah. it would be, it would be <laughs> Hugo Drax. Now, the other thing yeah. is, I, I think the actor, you know, favors, he's got a real Orson Welles look. Well, he does have an Orson Welles look, probably more than the one that I'm thinking, but he, he has like some really, really similar facial features to Peter Dinklage. And yeah. I've actually always been of the opinion that I think Peter Dinklage would be a superb Bond villain. He would. Yeah. So as I'm watching this movie, I just keep envisioning Hugo Drax as, as him. And I, I was like, that. I think he, I think Peter Dinklage would have been so much better in this role. Well, and what's a bummer is Drax is given some really flowery, fun dialogue that is just sort of given to us in a very flat way. Like, the, his line so we, bond shows up drax is like i have lost a couple of aircrafts i want an apology and yeah. bond is like absolutely we'll apologize as soon as we figure out where the moonraker really is you know uh -huh. um and drax says you've arrived at a propitious moment coincident to your country's one indisputable contribution to western civilization afternoon tea may i press you to a cucumber sandwich <laughs> My my no my note is cucumber sandwich. It's cucumber sandwiches. It's so funny. I that line makes me laugh really hard. And I wish, I wish there was a little bit more of this sort of cattiness. We get, uh, the movie plants the seeds of the xenophobic character that he is in the novel mm -hmm. more than he actually is in the film. I think the film plays it a little bit more fast and loose with that but there's lines yeah. here and there where he's just basically like i am better than you and here's why yeah. um i mean I, I, I think if that's one thing that i could say for all the bond movies so far is you know the the, the villains are usually a one to two note character yeah it, it, aside from the ones that show up multiple times throughout the movies most of the um, color comes from the henchmen being like these big bombastic characters characters with uh, superpowers or hook hands or gadgets, right. you know? And I think that's why people are so like into Blofeld when Blofeld's around and, you know, totally. uh, the, the villains that have a little more to than to them than just character. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there's more character background to them. And mm -hmm. I think that's, what's really kind of getting to me with a lot of the bond villains we're seeing here as of late is yeah. they're, they're, they're good for this one movie. And then we're moving on to the next one. Right. And I think, it works better. And maybe this is just because I'm used to more modern films of, of having that thread that continues to come back and be a threat to our hero. Yeah. 
And, you know, yeah, I mean, we get that with Jaws in this one, but is Jaws really all that much of a threat? Uh, uh, he's not because he ends up not being a threat at all in the end of the movie. <laughs> right, um, right. So, so it's, and, and trust me, I love a, an underdog story where a villain becomes a hero and all that stuff, even though in my brain, I'm like, that dude killed like 18 people of the last movie. Now he's right. just this good guy, but right. neither here nor there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's with, with Hugo Drax, I'm just like, I believe that this guy would be doing this, but like, I'm not having fun watching him do it. That's really what it is. Is like, I, I like the, I like his dialogue a good bit, but I wish there was just a little bit more flair to the performance. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, he's, he's right there next to Stromberg from the last movie, honestly, yeah. like is one of those just like, I've got my plan and that's what I'm going to talk about throughout the movie and right. blah, 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 blah. It's just a little one note and it's, it's boring. But he does have these moments like, uh, look after Mr. Bond, see that some harm comes to him is a great yeah. line. Uh, yeah. And so Bond is like, look, I'm going to have a look, see around your compound. And we meet Lois Childs as Dr. Holly Goodhead. And as as when what, what we do is I text Nathan when I'm like, this outlandish shit just happened in this movie. And the first thing I said <laughs> yeah. to Nathan was Dr. Goodhead. Really? Yeah. And, you know, in the Tough. behind the scenes, uh, you know, uh, what's her name? Uh, the actress? Lois Childs. Yeah. Lois Childs said she's actually proud that she has one of the more obscene names in the series. I have to be honest. I, I have to say that I actually like that I have one of the more obscene names. I do. I was shocked to find out that she was actually the woman in the hitchhiker segment of creep show Creep Show 2. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 was, I found that out today. Through the whole movie, I was like, I recognize her from something. Yeah. What is it? And I got on her IMDb and I was like, oh, shit, that's like one of my favorite creep show segments. Right. And she she's also uh, at this point, audiences would know her from uh, let's see. The Great Gatsby was before this. The yep. way we were. Yep. Um, she had not yet done, uh, she would go on to do Dallas, uh, yes. you know, uh, which is probably what most folks would recognize her from. A apparently she's in speed to cruise control also. Yeah. <laughs> I was just reading that she she's in cruise control. She's also in, uh, she had a scene in, uh, Austin powers, the first one that got cut. Uh, so I don't know what that would have been. Uh, yeah. I'm, ho I'm hoping it would just be a scene where she says I'm Holly Goodhead, but like it, it like that line, like this is one of the greatly terrible bond the, the bond names that transcends the films to the point where where my fiance even knows about Holly Goodhead and she's not seen any of these. I mean, this is definitely the prototype or this is where a lot of vagina came from. No, a lot no, of vagina. No. Sure. It, well, it's it's you know, it's the it's the, the spiritual successor to pussy galore. Right. True. Yeah. Um, but it is it's just so silly. And Bond is shocked to learn that a woman can be a scientist like he it is like that scene in the first uh, sort of dark place where matt berry goes like you're a woman like it's just that's really what it is and uh, to her like i love her line like your powers of observation do you credit mr bond unfortunately she says like powers of observation do you credit mr bond <laughs> <laughs> yeah her delivery leaves a lot to be uh wanted uh, definitely like she's yeah. not like uh, but there are things about her I do like, though. I agree. Like, no. Yeah. Uh, I think she is a very good counterpart to Bond. I think she's much better a counterpart to Bond than uh, the girl in The Spy Who Loved Me, honestly. That's like, what I was about to ask you. Was this the thing you thought was better? Uh, yeah. Because, again, yeah, we do have him working with another uh, secret agent. Uh, that that reveal kind of comes a little late in the game in this one. But, mm -hmm. yeah, she she's she's definitely sort of like an Anya type. And, in fact... She was, I think she was the, she was originally reproached to play Agent Triple X in The Spy Who Loved Me, oh. um, but she was, she had taken a break from acting at that time. Um, uh, she got this role apparently by being sat next to Lewis Gilbert on a plane. <laughs> I read about that. That's crazy. <laughs> and he was like, you want to be in my movie? And she's like, okay, sure. That's, um, that's all you got to do to be a bong girl. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And she was, she's, I do like how little patience she has for James. Like at this part of the movie, she's mm -hmm. a fully trained astronaut. She has no time for this shit. And she's, she is 
she even literally says like we don't want to lose time as well as a space shuttle do you like <laughs> <laughs> well i like that she also like throws james's shit back at him too it's yeah. like when she's trying to get him in the the uh what is like it the, called the, the g-force simulator yeah. the, the and she's like come she's like come on a 70 year old could handle three g's and like, i'm like girl look at this man <laughs> <laughs> It's funny, the further we go into these movies, the more I just kind of stare at Roger Moore's mole on his face. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it's becoming more powerful. Um <laughs> no, he yeah, because at this point I think he was 51, 52, which is funny in the in the Moonraker novel there is a line where James Bond says something to the effect of when I'm 45 I will be given a desk job and retired from the service and uh, Roger Moore was 45 when he started playing James Bond. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, James is really grating on me in these scenes because he's doing that thing where I think he thinks he's flirting, but like he's interrupting and doing his know-it-all routine with yes. everything she says. That was my note is like, she is, she's, she is kind of like the M in this movie. She like, she doesn't have time for Bond's like hoity toity shit that he sure. likes to do. She's yeah. like, no, there's, there's a point to what I'm doing here. You can go be James Bond. You're not being you want cute to. right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, unfortunately it all kind of goes the same way. It always goes with Bond girls by the end of the movie where she just decides. Um, yeah, I do actually, I'm fine with sleeping with you. That's cool. Like yeah. I, there, I cannot chart their, their relationship in this movie. Um, no, I but mean, I, also, after, I mean, after we get our, our debacle with jaws later, it's like instant sort of like, Oh, now oh I God. like you, James, you know, hilarious. Um, yeah. And it's also, it's broken up by sequences. Like, <sighs> How do you feel about this G force sequence? It goes on way too long. Yeah, it's um, a fun idea, but it it really does go on like way too long. I I like the little flashes of the meeting with M to like mm -hmm. remind us of you know the the dart gun and like all this stuff. And more, I think really plays the weakness of it really well when he gets off of the out of the little cart and he's staggering. Yeah, yeah. I think he's really good there. But yeah, it, it's just it kind of drags right. Yeah, I mean, I if they it, well, I mean, I, I understand you have to get up the momentum to get to the twelve G's or whatever it is. I <laughs> right. love, I love how they also set up like anybody that hits seven G's, you know, you can't usually handle it. And he goes up to twelve. It's yeah. just another one of those like this is how badass James Bond He's is. Made he can survive twelve G's. <laughs> yeah, uh, but He's basically Dutch from Predator. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> as soon as the centrifuge started going, though, I'm just like, I'm just going, you spin me right round, baby, right round. <laughs> you know? Sure. Uh, but it, yeah, it goes on too long uh, and it doesn't it doesn't lead to anything, really. It's uh, just basically no. like it's just know, a fun set piece. I mean, that's the thing I try to keep in mind about these movies, right? Like we talked about this, especially with like Dr. No and From Russia With Love is that so much of it is built around let's show audiences things that they don't normally see. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. so Dr. No is like, can you imagine being in a hotel in fucking Cuba? That's crazy. <laughs> um, and then this movie, you know, everyone's space crazy, right? We're, we're yep. like, we're, we, well, we just landed on the moon the previous decade, but like still the, the, the shuttlecraft system is like up and running. Everyone is still excited about stuff like star Wars Yep. And so let's show them how astronauts get ready in a fun little action scene. And uh, yeah, I, I get the thinking behind it. Yeah. You know, we've, we've kind of gotten, we've kind of gotten crap before on this channel. I, and I understand why when we say, yes, this was probably very cool to see 50 years ago. Uh, yeah. The, and the it, old Thunderball <laughs> conundrum. <laughs> And the finale of this movie, I'm afraid we might get some hate <laughs> on this one because uh, I got, yeah, <laughs> I got yeah, yeah. things to say about the finale in this movie. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's almost like you say Roger Moore is at this age where it's like, OK, we're going to have to start finding creative ways to to do things with Bond that aren't going to be so physical. Right. Uh, something that can wind him down, but mm -hmm. it's not going to be him having to fight a bunch of goons and all this because Roger Moore can't do all that stuff. Right. Right. Um, even though you've got your stunt performers that can stand in and all that, but still yeah. like um, I'm sure Roger Moore is just like, Hey, can we do something a little easier <laughs> this time around? No kidding. Yeah. Uh, so, I, but yeah, I mean, I, 
what this scene leads into and him, you know, sleeping with the helicopter pilot, Mm -hmm. um, you know, she, she has this love for bond. She's the only thing about her is Mm. she seems to go along with bond quite easily. If she's this big believer in Drax's mission and, and it's, it seems- it's not it's not as egregious as the woman in uh, Spy Who Loved Me who falls in love with him within three lines of dialogue and jumps in front of a bullet for him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it is it is kind of a similar thing where like and I think a lot of it comes down to uh, to, to this performer uh, to, to Corinne Clary being so interesting and and very like vulnerable and also, you know, very she she makes the decision right to hook up right with bond, which i which i appreciate like it is very much like okay i want this but i'm gonna i'm gonna give you some shit for it uh you presume <laughs> a great deal mr bond which is a fun joke but yeah i i do like he goes into her room and he tells her i'm not essentially says like i'm not here to sleep with you i just want information which is a very not james move at this point yeah yeah um especially but- where james ends up later in the movie oh my gosh and then but they sleep together and then he's like, I'm going to go snoop. <laughs> yep. And that's the thing. When she finds him snooping, she's just like, what are you doing? Yeah. Uh, it's like, you know, you think about the compound we're on and all the shit this guy's doing. I mean, and she, yes, she's probably blind to all the evil shit that he's about. Right. But when you find someone snooping about you, that's kind of a red flag. And she sort right. of just goes with James on it. He, she, he might be a corporate spy or whatever. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I do I'm, love this gadget here, the the X-ray safe cracker cigarette yeah. case. We don't need an explanation. It just kind of we can see how it works. I like that stuff. Yeah. And what's funny is they never introduced that, though. It just right. kind of shows up in that scene. Right. Um, but it's it's probably if I'm going to pick my favorite gadget of the movie, mm-hmm. it's probably that one. Mine it's too. the most it's, it's the most unique for yeah. sure. I, I really like the like, yeah, the digital display and all that stuff. I also like his little camera with the 007 branding on it. <laughs> yeah, I did. That was a little cheesy. I was like, really? I love but, it. Yeah, I, I love the little camera. The little sp- mm-hmm. In any spy movie, they got these little teensy weensy cameras. That they I use know. To take pictures and stuff. But um, uh, unfortunately, you know, her bad decisions with Bond here lead to her demise. Oh, my gosh. And yeah. this is. This is honestly one of the more brutal deaths of someone in a bond. It's movie. horrible. Yeah. I mean, so he he gives her a kiss. He says, take care of yourself. It feels very genuine. Like his thank you is very genuine. Yeah. Um, we see we cut to Drax and his homeboys shooting pigeons. Did you notice that guy plays uh, the 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 the, the spake there, Zarathustra? Like the, the bit from uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. That's like the... Like he does, he plays that when they stop. I did um, not notice that, honestly. <laughs> Bond like very casually kills a sniper. It's the only time he fires a gun in this movie. Um, yeah, I love then, the exchange there too, where the tracks is like missed Mister Bond. He goes, "Did I?" Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, but, but yeah, yeah this, they got a whole game of duck hunt. Look, I was <laughs> all, all I saw was original Nintendo, <laughs> right. <laughs> we needed we yeah we needed the dog to pop up after the uh the sniper was killed just snickering <laughs> you know um but yeah uh this chase yeah he, he he uh drax sends his bloodhounds after corinne and it's scary it's shot like it feels like almost all natural lighting right like yeah. it's it's it feels uh it feels like something almost like out of a giallo, like more than anything in a Bond movie. And then yeah. I, I kept thinking, though, I was like, it's really funny if they just waited a few years, they could have licensed a different Kate Bush song and put Hounds of Love over this. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's 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 upsetting. Like I I was really kind of I, I always forget at how visceral this scene is. Like she's screaming, she's like falling through the brush. Yeah. Like it's well I our typical know. thing that we've seen with the quote unquote, you know, bad guy bong girl or evil bong girl right. is you know, when they do meet their end, you're like, okay, well, she was working for the bad guys. And right. while this one is working for the bad guy, we've talked about she doesn't seem like she's really in on everything that's right. going on, and it's really like a upsetting death to see her just being ripped apart by dogs it's ripped just apart by dogs and yeah it just it and also most of the time when those the the quote-unquote bad bond girl 
gets taken out, it's something like they fall into a shark tank and we just, you know, don't look at them anymore. Or, yep. you know, in the case of the last movie, they get blown to smithereens. <laughs> yep. Um, in the case of a movie coming up, they get blown to smithereens. But I, <laughs> uh, yeah, it just, it feels mean. And it also, it really cements Drax as one of the more bloodthirsty villains. And I kind of, part of me kind of wishes the end of this movie had a little bit more of that juice, right? Like as, yeah, as, I mean, as horrible th- as this is like, let's see that guy. Yeah. That's pretty much my note for this whole scene is like, this is the villain that I kind of want through the movie. Yeah. And this is the only time we get him like really <laughs> cold, calculated, psychopathic, like, it feels villain. like something like Javier Bardem's character would have done in Skyfall or, yeah. or you know, something yeah. Dominic Green would have done in Quantum of Solace. Like it's fucked up. In it. No, I mean, I mean, when we get and when we get the reveal of what his entire plan is actually yeah. there to do, like, yeah, that is some evil shit. It is fucked up. But like the only time we see how evil he is, is, is this scene. Honestly, like, so the, re- yeah. the rest, the rest of it is all just this build up to him wanting to take over the world it's super it's just... villain posturing at the end yeah yeah um so after that awful moment bond uh has to head to venice because he saw vanini glass uh, listed on the blueprints uh that he took a picture <laughs> of uh, this is it is so funny how this movie is literally like bond sees something written on something and so now we got to go to another part of the world it happens like three times in this movie yeah yeah and 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 i'll be honest you know we have the scene with the dogs earlier in the film where he yeah. throws the meat to them and they don't do anything until he right. says, you until know, he snaps go. and yeah. And honestly, the first time I watched the movie, I think I fell asleep when the girl got torn apart by the dogs because really? when I watched it, when I watched it the second time, I was like, Oh, oh. that's why the dogs played an important right. part. Cause I, I didn't even realize this happened. So, um, but yeah, like all the, all the happenstances that get bond through, this plot of the movie yeah. are so loose and just sort of like, how would you even come to the conclusion? Like the glass, like the simplest thing of the glass is just like, yeah, this is, this is really just sort of like, it, we gotta get, we gotta get bond to the next place. Let's it, go. it feels even lazier than man with the golden gun, which was literally like, uh, you know, Oh, only one person makes this kind of bullet. At least that's <laughs> something right. Like, right. It, this time it's just like, oh, I saw a manufacturer. Like it might as well have been like he saw made in Taiwan. And so now I got to go to Taiwan uh, yeah. and just wander around till I find it. And instead he finds Holly uh, where he, I think this is when he sort of learns, okay, you're, you're there's something more to you. Like she says, mm-hmm. I don't want to be spied on. He says, I keep forgetting you're more than just a very beautiful woman, which is just <laughs> like, like, what? <laughs> yeah. Is that your placeholder flirt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he definitely never expects to see her whenever she pops up. Right. Uh, which is like, dude, you're James Bond. Like a beautiful <laughs> girl always pops up where you're at. Like everywhere. you should They're be everywhere. used to it by now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and then, you know, he goes through this tour of the glass place and it's mm-hmm. just like, why do we like, uh, I guess to develop what the glass is for. Yes, but it I'm really- watching. Does I'm watching all this and I'm much. just like, yeah, I'm like, why are we t- taking our time to talk about this shit? It's so it, we could lose a full 15 minutes of the movie without Venice. Like there is, I guess at the end we learn, oh, he used the glass to build the delivery device for this plague that he's going to drop on the earth. But like, I like mean, we the, get like the rock doesn't have a scene where Nick Cage is like, there's only one type of glass that can hold this nerve gas. Like, it's just <laughs> we don't need that. <laughs> I mean, you get the little hint of that when he gets in the laboratory and is messing with the vials. Right. He, he, like, he puts it in the little glass vase thing. And Can't but, be bothered to put it away. <laughs> no. And this is one of my favorite things about Bond in this movie <laughs> is he's just like leaves that shit there, goes back and hides in the control room and just lets these two dudes fucking die. Watches them melt like fucking deadites. Like it is. It's awful. Um, <laughs> also... Uh, another thing that follows Bond everywhere he goes besides uh, pretty ladies is a fucking boat chase. James Bond boat chase. We get two of them in this movie. Not one. We who boat chases in, in a in this movie, movie called Moonraker. We get two <laughs> boat chases. One laser <laughs> fight. 
two boat chases. <laughs> we're we're an hour into the movie. We've only seen a space shuttle at this point, and I'm like, where is? When are we going to space? <laughs> what would you have done? If he's like on the chase, he says, so he's in a boat chase in Venice. There's some great bits here. Like I love the funeral, like the casket that opens up and it's full of knives and he's got all these little <laughs> weapons. What would you have done if he goes around the corner and J.W. Pepper was there on vacation in Venice? <laughs> I was totally expecting him to be, to be honest with you. <laughs> I was a. I might have been a little disappointed when I didn't see his little fa his face standing there, but. Uh, I'm, is I'm, you an astronaut boy <laughs> <laughs> but no apparently this scene where the the, the gondola that he takes you know and they ha they apparently couldn't find a good gondola to use for all of this roger moore referred to as the gondola, which i'm like i fuck with this guy <laughs> so hard like he's a comedic genius <laughs> And apparently in the, when the, when it turns into the hovercraft <laughs> yeah. to go ashore, they had to shoot that five different times. Cause every time it would tip over. Oh, and wow. Yeah. They couldn't get any kind of regulation on the people that were watching the shooting in Venice at that time. Sure. So there were all these tourists and people in Venice watching them shoot these scenes, watching him get dunked over into the water multiple times. Right. He said they're lucky they got it on the fifth shot because he only had five suits. Right. He <laughs> ruined. He ruined. Yeah. Multiple suits. Um, we also th this is where the movie basically becomes Superman three. <laughs> or, or like a Beatles movie. Like this is a Richard Lester scene. We, there are so many so many fucking sight gags we we get um we <laughs> we we get uh, uh the, we, we get the return of victor trojansky as the man with the wine bottle who appeared yep. in the previous movie uh we get uh the painter with his easel getting knocked over and a fucking pigeon does a double take <laughs> one of the most infamous sequ did, did you know this was coming i had to i have to ask no and honestly i had to do a double take when it happened i was <laughs> like what the this, fuck this scene is infamous among the bond fan community like people are just like you say pigeon double take and a bond fan knows what you're talking about like it is wow it is truly uh, all the stuff that it. happens in this movie that's not what i thought people would take away from it <laughs> right which tells you how good the movie is right <laughs> exactly it's almost like the pigeon thing on his head in uh what was the uh was it golden eye uh or go yeah and gold not gold he, yeah. goldfinger yeah when he's got the pigeon on his head and he comes out of the water yeah love it. Uh, it's, I, the bird gags they they go for in these movies i tell you it's it's uh, what i what i do love the button on this scene is bond uh rowing his gondola into port taking <laughs> off his little hat and doing the classic hat toss onto the ornament on the boat i love that yeah and it uh, I, I i almost missed it because i'm not used to seeing it anywhere other than mi6 you know right totally and but as soon as he tossed it and i was like oh shit they just did that toss right like it was it was out of place and it i almost missed it but i'm glad i didn't <laughs> um so bond uh goes into this lab in the in the museum and the uh another little musical cue the combination to get into the lab is <laughs> from close encounters <laughs> oh it's, i didn't know that it's one of the it's uh, i can't think of the actual melody but it's one of the it's one of the melodies they play at the end of close encounters of the third kind which oh, is shit. so funny because this was the second movie that Sp Spielberg pitched himself to direct and they turned ah. him down. Um, absolutely bonkers. Uh, so then they end up just referencing him anyway. Uh, they have a character named Jaws and they have the song from Close Encounters. Uh, and yeah, this is where we get Bond basically causing a viral outbreak. Yeah. And I, it just, I don't know, it's something about the fact that he just stands there and watches the guys die. I mean, I understand they're working for the bad guy team. Right. But it's just one of those it's like oh well, i mean i didn't know this was going to happen oh, of course shit. i mean yeah and what's funny is when he goes back to to mi6 and reports and then they come back yeah everything's everything's gone like oh, yeah. what the hell happened well right before that we get the fight with cha the the bodyguard for hugo drax which is the we get 
I like this fight. I think it's the original version of the John Wick 3 glass room fight. <laughs> Well, interestingly enough, in the behind the scenes, they said that was the most expensive glass plate glass breaking scene that was ever shot at that time. It and was, in my in my mind, I was like, "Oh, wait till John Wick." All four. that sugar gas, <laughs> old glass. It, I, it's so so <laughs> sidebar. So I love the sequence in John Wick. Uh, yeah, it's John Wick three, right when they're they're smashing the uh, like all of the different museum. They run uh, together now. It's three or four. I think they do it in both movies, in both, honestly. But each time, each time it gets more ridiculous. I remember at the end of John Wick 3, when he goes up to Winston's office and he steps into the room and it's all glass play panels. Uh -huh. I started howling in the theater. I was laughing so fucking hard because I was like, all of that's getting broken. All of it's getting broken. He's about to fight Mark DeCoscos. There's not going to be any glass left. Um <laughs> I, it's a decent fight. I wish there was a little more sword play, but uh, you know, it, it, I think Roger Moore does a decent job. Um, yeah, I, I mean, just the, the fact that he's being thrown through things throughout yeah. the scene makes it a little more exciting than some of the Roger Moore fight scenes we've seen. Yeah, and the clock um, tower looks really cool. The interior, the clock tower interior, uh, <laughs> and I love how it ends with him going through the piano. Play it again, Sam. <laughs> yeah i mean i wasn't crazy about the one-liner there but uh i will say favorite goon of the movie i would say it's gonna be him uh, yeah Ch yeah so and i saw some places credit him as chang but they call him cha in the movie right yeah i i have it down as chang but that's where i am from writing my inf information down off the internet so yeah no it's interesting um, i but yeah i i agree i think he's you know he doesn't have a lot to do but that's a good fight uh i, I always love a one-on-one -on -one fight with a goon i mean honestly that's the best fight with bond in the movie i, I don't think anything any of the confrontations yeah. between he and jaws stand up to that at all no, no, I, yeah, it it does feel like Bond, and especially Roger Moore. I don't know if it was written around his age or the fact that he was not as like physically capable as Connery. Like he doesn't throw a punch like Connery did. We don't even no. really get his classic "I'm gonna hang from something and kick somebody" move. Um, oh no! Oh no! We do, sir. I do we? Did I miss it? This, I searched this movie for this motherfucker. Uh, <laughs> Does it happen in this like, scene? It happens on the cable car scene. You're right. Oh, of course. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 And um, and what and the reason and the reason you'll miss it is because it's not a close up shot of him doing it. Right. It's it's a, it's a wide shot. Right. But That's I was so like, funny. they they can't they can't do this without the signature Roger Moore. Hold on to something and kick somebody. It's and so good. I, the second time around, I was like, there it is. He totally kicks Jaws. Uh, you know, we're coming up to the cable car scene, but that, oof. Okay. Uh, that's, it's it's not my favorite fight sequence in a Bond movie. Right. At, at all. But again, um, it feel, that one also feels like, oh, I've seen, I've seen Honor Majesty's Secret Service. You know, I've yeah. seen a couple of th movies do this already. Um, so this is, yeah, Bond finds good head. <laughs> <laughs> he, has no, he has no problem with that he has no it's, it's, it's happened like four times already no he, <laughs> he finds and this is where he discovers everything she has is booby trapped she's got darts in her pen she's got darts in her diary her fragrance spray is flammable she has a radio in her bag she's cia yeah and james has a great line where he says i too have friends in low places and that's the kind of shit that i think roger moore sells really well yeah um they decide to team up. They immediately make out. I like that it feels like they're playing each other. Um, yeah. It feels more adversarial than his relationship with Anya in the last movie. Yeah, um, that's what like, I was going to touch on is like, yeah. this is more or less what I want out of that spy versus spy right. trope they were going for. And right. spy who loved me is Anya plays it more of a very like innocent. Ooh, I'm, I'm not a bad girl. And she is right. Whereas, you know, Goodhead is like, no, I'm not going to put up with your shit. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm just as, I'm just as capable as you are to do this stuff. It's, it's really interesting, right? Like they're going to work together. They will sleep together. But as she tells us, trust is out of the question, which yeah. I, I think is a fascinating dynamic that I wish the movie followed through on a little better. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I, I mean, I, lo- I even love Bond's response to that, where he's like, "Well, that's what makes it so fun, like that we don't <laughs> sure. trust each other, you know." And and again, that's that's what I wanted out of Spy Who Loved Me was mm-hmm. was that little bit of, you know, obviously because he's our hero, he's gonna end up with the girl at the end. I understand right. that. I understand what these movies are doing with those relationships and how that plays. Obviously, it was in a time where it was a lot. <laughs> more just like oh she's gonna fall in love with the guy but yeah it, it, you know it, i i like when our 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 female characters yeah don't just give in to bond it's like no you're gonna have to work like that's what, what we praised about pussy galore and sure. and and what ultimately ruined the, the character of pussy galore for us is how yeah. like, she changed on a on a whim and yeah well that's unfort- that's that's on that's on sexist screenwriters but yeah i agree with you <laughs> like yeah i, I mean I mean, I wish, imagine if Holly Goodhead was played by Carolyn Monroe from the last, who played Naomi in The Spy Who Loved Me, right? Like, if yeah, we had, yeah. like, a, a and I, I feel bad, like, kind of dogpiling on Lois Childs, but she's just not, her performance isn't that interesting to me. And I wish we had someone that felt a little more devious and felt like, okay, I believe this person is playing James Bond, you know? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I I, honestly, like, again, if anybody who's been listening to our show knows, like, A View to a Kill is the only one of these movies I've actually seen. Sure. Like, I can't wait to revisit Grace Jones in that movie <laughs> dude. after seeing all of these because I, Grace Jones is a fucking animal, dude. And I... Is, I and I, I tr- truly, um, th- I have not watched that movie since I went through a little Grace Jones period where I I started listening to a lot of her music. I re- I watched <laughs> Vamps. Like I've been like, I'm fully a Grace Jones stan, and so I am like excited <laughs> to revisit that movie as well. There are I can't wait for you to watch the behind the scenes stuff because there are some fucking crazy stories about Grace Jones and Roger Moore off camera. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, but, but I, yeah, I, like, I I agree. I love I love when Bond has a feisty counterpoint. A counterpoint like yeah it's just it makes it more interesting it, 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 i and it, it happens to grace jones in that movie too i mean she yeah. eventually sleeps with bond but she she doesn't just sort of like fall in his arms like it's sure. a little bit of a, a chore for him to get to her in that movie and yeah. I, I wish we got more of that out of some of the females but i mean look yeah. we're, we're 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 always chasing the highs of, of fiona volpe uh of 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 tracy bond you know like we're it's it's hard to and, compare and you know we, again we, we keep going back to tracy probably because she's the most interesting one the but it's just it's like you know she doesn't just give in to bond she right. makes him work for the love that they have for each other yeah and while th- there are scenes in that movie where she may seem like she turns on a dime no like that movie goes through the links of showing you what bond has to do to court her and how their relationship ends up where it ends in in the movie and how she doesn't really let him off the hook for being a dog you know right uh, which right. is one of the, the great things about her and uh yeah i i i am excited to revisit next month's movie because i my recollection is that we have a very strong bond girl in that one um so uh but we will we'll see in the, in the in the months to come uh we're going to I think we're going to see a sort of change in how they approach the female leads in these movies um for for better and for worse. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh but I do I love the sequence where they go in to the where the laboratory was and they put on their gas masks. So we didn't even mention we've got Frederick Gray uh the Minister of Defense back uh-huh. once again. Uh who they all put on gas masks. The lab is empty now. Now it's just another office for Hugo Drax and minister wants James off the assignment. And we get one of my favorite scenes between Bernard Lee and Roger Moore, which is where. And I think this is why I don't, this scene is probably why I don't think M is as snarky as he is in other movies. Sure. Uh, Because that exchange between he and bond there seems very like, wink Eternal. wink it's like wink wink and genuine yeah it's not it's not one of those like wink wink i fucking hate you go die this movie it's, reminds you that they trust each other that there is a genuine relationship there um, and, and while he has his moments where he's like god damn it bond like it's it's not like it is in the other movies and i definitely saw a change there it's especially it, it's so good that this is i mean i hate i hate that he passed away but like it is so great that this is their final scene together, like in one place. I, I, yeah, and, I just, I absolutely love it. 
and like the and I think the line that you like the most that Q says is coming at the end. I'm it is. I'm I'm glad they didn't give that line to M for his last line of a yeah, Bond movie. You absolutely. Know? But yeah, M is like, uh, well, I'm gonna put you on two weeks of leave. James is like, okay, well, here I found this fucking deadly chemical. Let get Q to analyze it, and M <laughs> just basically just uh, you know agrees to look the other way while James goes to Rio for the next mm-hmm. piece of the puzzle. Um, and- and this yeah. is where I wrote, this is the horniest Bond has been so far. Yeah. It's because he gets to Rio. He finds a, a, a lovely young woman following him around, taking pictures. Sure. And then she just appears in the presidential suite that he has. Yeah. And you know, how do you kill five hours in Rio? You know, it's like he, it, she is literally. Like, come on, man. It's like, come on. And like, I, I find her more interesting than some of the other Bond girls we've seen, but she's yeah. literally there to sleep with Bond, give him a little bit of information, yeah. and at least not die in this one. Nearly die, right. but not die. Yeah, this is this is Emily Bolton as Manuela, who, yeah, is just quickly hooks up with him. She's from, like, the, she's like from the nearby office of the Secret Service. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, but he does. He sits down. He's like, how do you kill five hours in Rio if you don't Samba? I'm like, come yeah. on, man, you just met. But right. it leads to a parade scene, which I always love in a Bond film. And uh, oh, so we've got Jaws has entered the picture. He's been called up from the henchman service. We get the great bit with him <laughs> going through the metal detector at the airport. <laughs> Imagine that... sitting behind that motherfucker in a flight. <laughs> Every scene this dude is in, I'm just like, God, man, he's so big. Yeah. And like I called this out in Spy Who Loved Me, how like when he holds James, his hand is as big as his face. Yeah, yeah. And that you see stuff like that multiple times in this movie of yes. just how big Richard Richard Keel is. Like he he's a massive guy, dude. And like that's the that's that's probably the other thing that sort of irks me about Jaws is really I feel like he could be a lot more intimidating in this movie at least. Mm-hmm. And he he ends up being played for laughs a lot. Like yeah, I do think that this sequence with the clown costume coming down the street. I think it's good. I think it's scary. I think it's unsettling. I I did accidentally hit my uh, PlayStation remote so that it started playing at 1.5 speed. And so the way he was moving, I did not care for it. Um, <laughs> you you thought that clown was gonna come crawling through the TV set after but he, you? <laughs> but he has this bit where he he pulls that mask off and he just kind of stands up and smiles. And I yeah, I, the the thing about Richard Keel, particularly in in these in these movies, is he is so great at knowing exactly how to position himself on camera. He knows he's got. Yeah. He's got that thing that I've talked about on Silver Linings playlist about Robert England, I feel like, where he knows exactly the way to like sort of pose the, yeah. the the little micro expressions he does. I think he's a really underrated actor. He was a really underrated actor, um, a physical performer. And he is uh he's genuinely chilling in this sequence. Um what doesn't work here is that he picks her up. And then just kind of hangs on to her for a while. Yeah, it's again like how it's played for this silly little bit. How all these people are coming out of the cabana, and they eventually just ju- like push him back into the parade. Yeah. And after all this shit goes down, where he almost you know bites her neck, and Bond saves the day, they're just casually walking away as Jaws is right down the alley, just being like somehow pulled away being, by people, somehow being hustled away by a guy in a cock sock and like all these folks like partying. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like, you know, again, that's another thing that I think does a disservice to Jaws. And this is just like, Oh, he's, he's gone now. We don't have to worry about him. It's like, no, that motherfucker's still down the alleyway. You need and to be getting out of there. And I feel like there should be a moment. I mean, we do get it later on in the movie, but I feel like this, this should be the moment where James is just like, why aren't you dead? Well, haven't I killed you like four times? And instead we, we do get that great bit later on where Holly is like, do you know him? And he goes, not socially, which is a really funny bit. 
But I, I do, I do. I mean, we're coming up to this sequence here where with the cable car. Uh, yeah. Yeah, like when she's like, you know him? He's like, not socially, but uh, his name's Jaws. He kills people. He kills people. <laughs> which is, I, I love that line. I really like it. Like, that's all you need to know. He's the tallest man you've ever seen, and he murders for a living. Yeah. Um, I, I do think it's kind of silly when he's standing there biting the cable. <laughs> I mean, all the biting bits are silly. Yeah, I agree. But, but this, I mean, this whole cable car sequence is, is really rickety, man. Like, no, so, no, no pun intended. So, so Bond, right, when Fox Mulder can do a cable car stunt better than Roger Moore, like, we're in trouble. <laughs> but, like, so so Bond, another, like, loose bit of connective tissue, Bond goes all the way to Rio to look through this warehouse and Which is finds, completely empty. Completely empty, except for a one label that says Drax Air Freight. And he's like, well, now I got to go there. So now we get to see fucking Yo Gabba Gabba, this cute animal band <laughs> in the square, which I love. If, if we were doing Silver Linings playlist, this would be my bit part. I'd be the dog with the tuba. But like... <laughs> you said Yo Gabba Gabba. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> this was also where I began to realize this movie has a ton of product placement we got british airways uh seven uh, up dude the, seven the up giant definitely. seven up sign was nuts yeah th there's a there's a marlboro sign which is fucking crazy i kept <laughs> trying to figure out was this because it's double like should it should it have said 007 up would, would they allow that to happen <laughs> is it because it's 007 is going up like is that why oh my god that would be so great if that was the reasoning i mean it could <laughs> It could have been, honestly. Who knows? I mean, uh, I the quality like, of jokes in this movie. Yeah, I mean, they were definitely going for that Richard Lester like gag comedy for a lot of this stuff. Totally. It's, I mean, it's not as good as you would see in, no, it, in one of those movies. That's the thing. When I say Richard Lester gags, I mean that as a compliment because <laughs> yeah. I, I think the opening sequence of Superman three is great. I will fight yeah. people over it. A Hard Day's <laughs> Night is one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, so I, when I say sub Richard Lester, I mean it like they, they're not even reaching his heights. Right. Um, you know, it bond bond checks out the airfield and he finds Holly doing the same. And I do like that. She's mad that he took off after they slept together, but he's like, look, you, you were going to do the same thing. So why don't we just hang out? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And this is where they have the exchange. I got to it a little early. This is where they have the exchange about trust and yes. whatnot and how he's like, you know, like, yeah, we don't trust each other. That's what right. makes it exciting for me. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. like, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's sort of like what you wanted out of Pussy Galore and right. Goldfinger is like, no, like you need to explain to me why you left, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. right. It's like finally someone calling Bond out on his bullshit other than Tracy, mm -hmm. who, you know, um, but yeah, this, I instantly went back to on her majesty's secret service with the cable car stuff here. Yeah. And it, 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 it might be because it's, it's a good sequence in on her majesty's secret service, but this is just like, okay, this well, is one of the least exciting fight sequences it, I've seen so far in, in secret service. It's during that escape, right? So we have all the added pressure of bond being on the run and scared. It's still right. maybe my favorite chase scene in any bond movie. Like I, I, tr I love how desperate uh, J George Lazenby is in that sequence. Uh, and, and how like, the the way his eyes light up when Tracy finds him and this one yeah. is just sort of like a rote action sequence you know mm -hmm. um, yep. he, Holly doesn't even sound that when she goes hang on James like it's <laughs> yeah I, uh, it's just not great I do yeah. I do love Jaws sabotaging the wheel the thing the lift with his bare hands and the gag of him starting to walk away and then realizing the wheel is still turning like it just kind of look it's it's really it's a good little physical comedy bit uh and then you know we they they have their whole meet in the middle moment right and with this other guy that looks like the uh the the it, henchman from the last movie like come yeah, back he looks to like life. the guy that that bond knocked off the roof in the last movie <laughs> in the it's best like, kill of the previous film yeah <laughs> right it's like oh no i think that dude's dead if he's not dead then well uh, we've seen jaws fall out of an airplane and survive so i guess anything right. is possible <laughs> right <laughs> it's like That's, a fucking marvel movie don't like, don't think anybody's dead they will be back 
Do you notice that guy's shirt was filthy? Like he looked like he'd spilled like great. He like ate a famous bowl wrong. Like he just there was just gravy everywhere. <laughs> a fucking famous bowl. Yeah. <laughs> He's got mashed potatoes and corn just running down his face. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, yeah, like I don't know the fact that they had to do this scene with the fight being the background projection. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously they can't do it the way they would have done it for real, but like some of the, the whole rear projection works though. I think the zip line stuff looks good. I, the, I, 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 I don't know. The rear, the rear projection isn't my problem with this. It's really okay. just the, 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 the stunt performing that's going on. And yeah, like the whole shot of, 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 of jaws, like leaping over to the other car looks really, like yeah. they didn't have a good way to to convey that on There's film. There's a couple of those. There's also this movie uses a lot of goofy speed ramping to try to uh -huh. sell a stunt that I, that we don't need. Like I, you know, I I buy that James is using a zip line. I don't need you to do like a weird little, you know, speed up, speed him up. But like, eh, yeah, I, I like the, the headbutt. Like I like the headbutt, and anytime the headbutt that hurts James and that anytime, anytime James and Jaws smile at each other, I like it. It's good stuff to me. Yeah. And there, there's one time when Jaws actually like smacks the shit out of good head. And I was <laughs> yeah. like, I was like, how is this woman still on this cart? Number one and yeah. two still alive. Like I do a, love that she's in on the fight though. Like there's never, anytime there's a scrap, like she's right there. She's got a, you know, at the end of the movie, she's got like a pipe and she's wailing on motherfuckers. Like, yeah, she gets and, a laser the, gun. It's so funny, like when they're getting on the roof of the car, too. He's like, yeah. grab that chain. It's like, what would a chain be doing in here? It's like, it's just <laughs> right. so consequential for what you're about to be doing. <laughs> Uh, um, but I I do yeah. like the 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 wrap the chain around the cable and 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 go down like that. Bit. That's all fun. Um, you know, would the cable car have caught up to them a lot faster than it does? Right. Probably. Uh, but when they fall and he crashes into the Seven Up building, uh, two things. Number one, we get the moment with Goodhead and and Roger or, or Bond where he's all of a sudden he is Mister Sex now. And she's right. like, oh, you saved my life. That's it. James just has to save their life. And then, then that's it. Their panties are wet and it, it's the it's end. So, yeah. And, and I'm just sort of like, girl, like you are a secret agent. There's no way you haven't saved your own damn life a bunch of times. <laughs> I don't know. It, it does feel like a weird quick turn. And a lot of it is just down to the fact that I don't. I don't find that they have very much chemistry. And I no. I, I feel this way about a lot of Roger Moore and his leading ladies like uh, Jane Seymour, maybe accepted. Like, I just don't. I don't yeah, really but buy Jane this Seymour, relationship. But, but the rain, but the relationship between he and Jane Seymour and Limelight dies was gross. manipulative. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, just it's it can either it can either be terrible and 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 whatever or or just gross. <laughs> just, oh, if you want to if you want to talk about a love that will stand the test of time, then we got to talk about the introduction of Dolly, played by Blanche Ravelick, who <laughs> rescues Jaws from his uh, from his uh, from the rubble of the uh, accident here. And I'll go ahead and say it. She's my girl of this movie. I, I think, love Dolly. Yes, King. I think she is fabulous. Like on first watch, I was like, are they really going to do this? This is a little silly. But by the end of the movie, I was like, you know what? Good for her and good for Jaws. Like, you know what? I, I, <laughs> I just realized I should have worn my Dolly Parton T-shirt today. But uh, <laughs> I I was. Uh, yeah, no, I, I love this sequence. It's so silly. We get Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet sound drop here. And the fact that they fall in love at first sight is so funny to me. Did you know that this movie is a this scene in particular is a prime example of the Mandela effect? Like it's no. one of the ones that's always pointed to along with like the Berenstain Bears thing. Uh -huh. uh, a huge num uh, amount of the population remembers that in this scene, Dolly, when Dolly smiles at Jaws, she has braces. And like the <laughs> gag is that they both have like metal in their mouths, which I love. But the, the the filmmakers have gone on record as saying that doesn't exist. That was never shot. But a whole generation of people remember seeing that in the theater. It's so bizarre. Yeah. Uh, and honestly, I didn't know that. I had never heard that before. But yeah. I, 
that would have put the icing on the cake for it's, me. It like, would have been would... a really funny guy, especially since she doesn't have any dialogue. Like how, how great would that little smile have been? Right. Um, she has no dialogue, but they do have Jaws talk at the end of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, but, but no, I, I, I was on first watch. I was hesitant to, to go along with Dolly and, and Jaws, but yeah, as the movie went on and then the second time I watched the movie, I was just like, you know what? This is too adorable not to like. And I think it's Dolly so... is is just a, a, a she's gorgeous. And like she the is, fact that but also like it's such a sweet performance. Like the she gives, you know, she she's the reason that Jaws kind of like has his hero turn at the end of the movie. Uh -huh. uh, she's clearly game for some of the physical comedy like there's a there's a bit where they run towards each other in slow motion that is so funny <laughs> and I, I i i don't know what it is about this pairing but like yeah it there's there's a sweetness to it uh i, I just i don't know it's such an insane swing now i will say christopher wood the screenwriter of the film has mm -hmm. gone on record saying he hates dolly it was not his <laughs> idea to put her in the movie she's not in the original screenplay and she's not in the novelization of the screenplay that he wrote, um, which <laughs> I got to throw this out here. So Moonraker, the film, has such little resemblance to the original novel that they were able to put out a novelization of Moonraker called James <laughs> Bond and Moonraker that tells the story of the movie. <laughs> Well, my, I mean, maybe that was my trepidation about Dolly the first time watching it was like, oh, this is kind of silly. But uh, again, like you're going for so much silly in this movie. Right. It's like it just kind of how is the... this a bridge too far? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, uh, bad guys need love, too. And, and you know, he doesn't yeah. he, does, he, he ends up a good guy. Then, so. well, and what was what was really fun was uh, I read this thing where the producers were like a little iffy on playing with the height difference there because he's so tall and yeah. and he uh richard keel mentioned well she's the same height as my wife in real life and so they were like oh okay well cool there's yeah. a pot for every lid you know <laughs> like <laughs> oh man you gotta wonder sometimes though with people that are that big it's like oh, that's a that's that's gotta be a weird uh it's gotta be a weird game of uh a twister, you know, <laughs> uh, but no, you. I, yeah, I mean, I, you know, in her yellow sundress and everything like I, I, I'm on board with Dolly. Like she's definitely my favorite it, girl in the movie. It's so funny to me that she quickly just becomes part of the villain organization though. Like he just brings her on board. She's got one of Drax's fun little jumpsuits. Um, yeah. I, I also wanted to mention, like, I don't know if we talked about this last time, but uh, Richard Keel was one of the first uh, people to be considered to play the Hulk in the Incredible Hulk in the 70s. Oh, um, no, we didn't talk about this. He he actually starred. He was on the pilot and uh, producers decided they wanted a, a more muscular guy as the Hulk. Uh, right. So they they let him go and they cast Lou Ferrigno. Um, and afterwards he was like, look, I am so glad I dodged a bullet. I fucking hated the makeup. I hated the contact lenses. Let someone <laughs> else do this. Um, but like, if you look at Richard Keel's filmography, the guy worked nonstop. And I just think that's fantastic. I, I, the, the, he was great. He was on everything. I mean, truly everything. He was on the wild, wild west. He was on the twilight zone. He was in the man from uncle. I dream of genie. He did like multiple episodes of the monkeys and Kolchak, the night stalker. Like he's a <laughs> legend. Well, he's just, you know, and again, like, you know, he, he's a rarity in Hollywood, too. It's like you mm -hmm. have these certain actors that have this height and stature that you need for these overwhelming sort of characters. It's like yeah. the, the the big guy who plays um, in like the, the Rob Zombie movies who did. Um, I can't remember the characters. Tiny, I think, is his name. Oh, Tiny um, Lister. Yeah. Right. And yeah. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, Tiny Lister, Debo from, <laughs> from uh, Friday and shit. Like, right. You, you've got certain guys that just like they have that that stature about them where it's like, okay, yeah. And like, when you need a big dude, that's the dude we got to go with. You know? It's shorthand for badass also, right? Like you right. see, you see Richard Keel walk on camera and you're like, Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, when, you when your hand covers your entire hero's face, I mean, yeah. That's that's definitely something you got to be stick take a step back on. And in fact, like he even played Jaws one more or a couple more times after this. They used archival footage of him in some James Bond video games, but he full on 
played Jaws again in a video game, uh, uh, James Bond Everything or Nothing, which was a, a, a game starring the Pierce Brosnan version of James Bond. Huh. Uh, yeah, he just the, the guy, he loved Jaws and loved he loved that character. And I see. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the thing about doing a show like this. I say this on our on, on the VHS Files podcast yeah. all the time, too. It's like when I when I walk away from a movie feeling a certain way about it, I, I, I come to the podcast, I do our conversations, we talk about the movie, we talk yeah. our opinions through it. And it's it definitely gives me something different that I'm walking away from the movie from now. Um, cause you know, there's already things we've mentioned about this that I'm like, okay, that's not as bad as I really think it was. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I can't understand why people love the character of jaws, even though I think compared to the last movie, it's a lot goofier than that sure. one. Um, I, I but, do the same thing with the comics podcast. The number of times that I've read a book where I've been like kind of on the fence about it. And then we've had uh, a guest on AIPT comics that it's like, talk to us about their thought process and their craft. And yeah. I've walked away from the interview loving the book now. I mean, that, that happens like, and that's kind of, that's kind of the fun thing about these conversations we get to have. And again, even the Bond movies that I don't love, I'm happy to talk about. Like this yeah. is a joy that I that I take in in discussing these it, dumb, it, you dumb know, movies. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, trust me. There's nothing better than walking away from a movie loving it. Like we just right. watched, we just watched The Man from Nowhere recently. Oh yeah, and, uh -huh. which is a, a Korean film. And if you have not seen that movie, God damn, check that movie out. It's so good. Yeah. Um. But I, you know, it's just I love when you have those sort of reactions to movies. But I also like I take comfort in those movies that don't really hit me right the first sure. time, but the second time or after I talk about them with someone, it's like, oh, I'm thinking about that movie completely differently now. And honestly, I mean, we're not to the end of the movie yet, but this movie has such a reputation for being a bad movie. It's not the worst movie I've seen. Like it's it's sure. not a I mean, I mean it's, that, it's, that's the joy also of you and I both having multiple movie podcasts, right? Like, right. I, I just spent two hours talking about 2006's Stay Alive. And then <laughs> Moonraker was like a salve. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even, you know, it's it's worth it to watch it sometimes to hear your wife wa uh, sitting next to you watching the movie go, this is stupid. It's like, <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. it is. Yes. But, but I'm having a great time watching it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, which I will, I will, I want to throw this out to the listeners uh, slash viewers. If you were going to show your partner their first <laughs> Bond movie, classic era, what would it be? And I will say, I don't think she'd vibe to Goldfinger. So let's ex accepting Goldfinger. I'm I'm leaning towards Live and Let Die, which I think might be insane, but I think that's going to be the one that we watch. <laughs> Keep in mind, she likes kitsch. Not as much as I do, but she likes kitsch. Secret Service. Come on. Man. I know. On. Yeah. I Come think on. that might end up being the one. I mean, it's my it's my favorite, but I also feel like we got to work up to that. One, but right? it's also one of those where it's like we've kind of gone off on a tangent here, but that's what this is for. Kind of. It's yeah. like, you know, that's another one of those movies, too, where it's like you you have a love for a movie so much that you kind of like you're afraid to show it to people mm -hmm. because they won't feel the same way you feel about it. I also got to say it's the episode that more than any of the ones we've done, I wish I could redo because I am in so in love with that movie that that episode is essentially just me recapping it while you try to get things in. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe someday was, we'll relitigate Honor Majesty's Secret Service. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll revisit that one. In I mean, couple years. that's that's definitely one of our highest viewed. It's like over 6,000 views. So yeah, I think people like the fact that we love it. But um, <laughs> meanwhile, uh, Bond and Holly are making out in the grass for no reason. <laughs> and these 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 paramedics come out of nowhere. Yeah, it's like I was confused when they show up, too, because obviously yeah. they're they're not really paramedics, but it's. Like, does 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 Hugo Drax have that close of an eye on everything that he's sending these people after them? I could it, not make heads or tails of that. And also Bond looks at them and goes, no, we're good. And then goes back <laughs> for another kiss like you dumbass. <laughs> uh, and, and then this this is another like really goofy scene in the back of this ambulance where you've got. You've got Goodhead and Bond both sort of like winking at this guy. Yeah. And it's like one of us is going to make him hard and then we can yeah. make our escape. 
<laughs> I just, I was, I was watching that scene going like, are they really doing this right now? It's so and, silly, but I love, I, I actually really like it. I like the fist fight in close, close quarters. I love that bit where she takes some of that dude's hair. Cause she's like hanging <laughs> on to it when he gets punched. But when he when he ends up out of the ambulance is some of that like speed weird ramping. speed ramping yeah. that you were talking and about. It's a, it's a good stunt. Like that's the thing is like I would love to watch this in like full speed. He's yeah. going out the back of this and maybe they can't because the ambulance is going, you know, 10 miles an hour <laughs> yeah. when they do it. But like that dude going into the, the mouth of the British Airways poster is really funny. And we had just seen the Marlboro ad and I thought right. that was going to like, I thought it was going to end up being him like looking like a cigarette. Sure. But then when it shows the British Airwaves thing, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but, and what's funny is he rolls down this hill and then the ambulance is still going and, and Bond walks back towards the ambulance. Like, like calmly. Yeah. Smash it, cut to him inexplicably riding a horse <laughs> while Bonanza music plays. <laughs> I was like, when did the good, the bad, and the ugly come on? <laughs> and then, yeah, it's like this Morricone wannabe score. And then it, nothing is really connecting for me here because he's riding horses. He's dressed like the man with no name. And he arrives at a m monastery? With with karate, karate monks. monks. <laughs> That's what I wrote down. <laughs> karate monks. And, and it's just... It, it comes out of nowhere, and you, when you see Karate Monks, you're like, what? It feels and like then, they saw Tiger Tanaka's school, and they were like, we have Tiger Tanaka at home. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, usually when he's, well, no, I can't really say that, because usually <laughs> when he visits the secret MI6 the headquarters, yeah, yeah, like, it, it usually is something like the the, the ship in, in, uh, in Man with the Golden Gun was like, what's going on right now? Yeah. So. I can understand them disguising it, but this time it was really just sort of like, whoa, wait, like Money really Penny's weird. here? Like Money Penny's here. Uh, Q and Q is building some uh, racially I, questionable traps. <laughs> you got I love when Pawn walks up to Q and he's like balls. balls. <laughs> Bowlers 007. Uh, but when he when he throws those and it wraps around that head and blow oh my god dude but there's, my there's face also, yeah go ahead <laughs> my favorite one is that one that looks like a dude crouching down with a sombrero and it just, it, and it just opens up and it's here's the crazy like, thing there is a sombrero over the face there is a blanket over or you know a poncho over it that they went through the trouble of building a head that splits up like you can see hair and skin when it splits open and fires. And then we get the most upsetting laser demonstration I've ever seen because that well, looks like a human being melting. Yeah, it, it, but but you see all of this somewhat practical stuff around, and then totally. all of a sudden it cuts to a guy with a white Star Wars blaster, yeah, just, <laughs> just lasering some some face that's melting. It's, it's like what nuts, and no one respond, <laughs> no one comments on it. James isn't like that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Like it's. <laughs> It's crazy. And I, I love, but I do love when they go in for the meeting and Q is like, I've analyzed this uh, substance you gave us. You seem to be right, 007. The look on James's <laughs> face is so funny. <laughs> you uh, seem to be right. It's just like, yeah, okay. And he knows everything about this rare Amazonian orchid that yeah it's like if you people. knew that much about it then how did you i mean i don't know bond is is, is such a scamp dude. Well, it's what's, like what's funny to me is that later on in the movie we learn bond knows that this orchid causes sterility but uh -huh. like drax has developed it to the point where it now melts people like we saw in the laboratory like it burns right. people like acid and i kind of almost think the scarier plot is I'm going to drop a bomb that makes the earth go sterile and then I'm yeah. going to wait it out for a generation. Like that's, that's a way more unsettling plot, right? Yeah. It's, it's way better than genocide. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's still genocide, but it's the long way around. You yeah, know? yeah. You're ta taking the long way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this is another one of those sort of like classic golden eye or yeah. I keep saying golden eye gold, gold finger, finger yeah. reveals of like, Oh no, this, this is a lot more sinister than it really appears to be. Right. It's not just like a financial plot. Like he, he's going to kill people. Um, 
And so kill everybody. He's gonna kill everybody. <laughs> and so Bond is like, okay, well, I'm gonna go to the Amazon where this flower is originally from that they're using to create this uh, disease, and we get our second boat chase. Boat chase. <laughs> I do, I do love that Q is like, I have something that I think you could use. And then it cuts to him in a boat. And I'm like, you had the boat at the monastery? <laughs> it's not like the little, what, what was it? The little Netty? What was the little, little Nelly? Helicopter? Yeah, the little, little Nelly. Yeah. Uh, God, we, I, what, what, what would you have done if they would have like opened a suitcase and started building this boat? Out I of actually would have loved it in the little time lapse photography. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, this again, like travel log, we've got to get to the Amazon or whatever this, <laughs> this place is. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, it's like, again, like th- these, these bombs just start going off out of nowhere. Yeah. Jaw- Jaws is there with some more henchmen shooting at Bond. It's this like kills. Me. So I, I love the photography here. I think all the stuff in the, in the Amazon looks really gorgeous. Even the obvious dummies don't really bother me because there's some great <laughs> explosions here. What makes me laugh so hard is Jaws ordering the other boat around just by gestures like he'll just point (laughs) and i'm like this motherfucker can't speak and they're so are they just like someone's at the wheel and they're just looking over in case jaws wants them to go somewhere Uh, (laughs) that insult to injury is he can speak he just doesn't he doesn't he chooses not to he's difficult he's an artist um (laughs) but artist formerly known as jaws (laughs) (laughs) uh i love (laughs) The, I love the seeker missiles. I think that's a really fun, like the little heat seeking torpedo is a good effect. Um, this, this, this boat chase kind of reminded me of um, one of the better boat chases from Russia with love. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, you know, with, with all of the, the, the torpedoes and, and, stuff, the, and the yeah. mines and all that stuff. Like this was a lot more exciting than like going through the canals in Italy or, you know, agree. it, 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 it looks seems pretty. To, yeah, and then <laughs> we get a, a two for the price of one gadget here. Uh, not only is this boat got all these crazy gadgets yeah. and torpedoes and landmines, it has a built-in hang glider. <laughs> the hang glider escape is great, but you're telling me they wouldn't just shoot his sail out? I mean, they've got they've got AKs. Like, what are they doing? I I don't know, but I do. I love the little gag of Jaws accidentally pulling the steering wheel off and going over <laughs> the waterfall. Like that stuff all works for me. And another instance of Jaws just falling to not his death. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, but I was almost expecting the hang liner scene to end just like in live and let die where he uh-huh. just lands all prim and proper and then tears his stuff off and he's got his suit on underneath. Yeah. Uh, he, he doesn't land as gracefully in this one. No, it ends like the gliding scene in the Batman where he just eats shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which that's one of my that's one of my favorite scenes in the Batman dude. It's just like it's it's like oh no, this motherfucker doesn't always have a good landing. He's so good (laughs) at jumping off of buildings, but he is not great at like finishing the job. It's so good. But you know, he ends up in the middle of the Amazon, and then all of a sudden he finds this lair person. Or he finds oh, a person right. walking around in the middle of the of the forest. Well, he sees a hot lady in a waterfall, and he's like, "The last time this happened, it was Honey Rider, so I better follow her." <laughs> uh, he's looking great in this like gray safari number he's got on. And that was a note I made too. Is you know uh, we're we're so used to in the in the Connery Bonds him yeah. being in the in the suits all the time. I mean, you've got where we've got our linen, you know, our 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 famous linen suit and whatnot in certain points. But like, you're always used to seeing Sean Connery, like all nice and done up. And then you, you get a lot more of Roger Moore in these just different outfits throughout yeah. the movie. You don't always get him in the, in the suit and tie. And he definitely plays off like the safari guide uh, look really well yeah. in this one. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's similar to when he's got that like white, like chiffon shirt in uh man with the golden gun where he's looking yeah. run down, but he looks really good. in like just a yeah. white, you know, button up. Uh, and yeah, there's something very utilitarian about the way bond dresses. Uh, Roger Moore's bond dresses when he's on a mission. He loves, mm-hmm. he loves a turtle. He loves a tactile neck as Archer would call <laughs> it. Uh, but yeah, he, he follows this, this girl to a temple, like this Mayan temple. And I think this set, 
rules. This is so Yeah, this good. is another like classic villain lair. Looks a lot like uh, Stromberg's from the sure. last movie, except it's in the middle of the rainforest. Um, and we get that uh, hilarious bit where he stands or, and kind of looks around at the ladies for a bit. And then this rock just tilts up and knocks him into the water. So, uh, interestingly enough, I, I might have mentioned this on this podcast before. I know I have on VHS files, but, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of snakes. And Sure. You're very course, much like Indiana Jones that way. Very much. And uh, my whole motto is fuck snakes. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, so when the snake showed up in this one, they're like pythons don't really bother me. But still, it's like if you're going to have a snake do some evil shit, I don't know, I'd rather not see that. But apparently they had two pythons they got for this. And they couldn't get it to chase the stunt guy in the water. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they kept just wanting because the water was cold. And they kept slithering up to the, the like dock they had and they would sunbathe. Mm -hmm. So what they had to do to get the snakes to chase the guy in the water was literally put him in the water and then let them go to go to the dock to sunbathe. Uh -huh. And he would just like stay with the snakes as they went to sunbathe. That's really Like funny. they cared nothing about this guy yeah. at all. Well, that, that must be why some of the more actiony shots are the fakest snake I've ever seen in my life outside yeah. of and like Dr. No. Now, here's where I was a little confused. The way he gets out of this entanglement with the snake is with the pin. Yeah. That, did he take that from Goodhead's or was no, yeah, was it Goodhead's? But that's bedroom? one of the ones that's in the watch. You know, uh, the, at the beginning uh. of the movie, Q is like uh, one of, you know, it shoots darts some of them are armor piercing some of them are tipped with a deadly venom and okay. so i think that i think he used one of the uh one of the venomous darts on the snake <laughs> well, that's kind of funny right um <laughs> well, use venom on a venomless snake uh, uh but you know anybody who's paying attention would notice that all these people that have gathered at this little you know rainforest oasis are the astronauts from the beginning of the movie right and this is where we start to get our reveal of what what Drax's real plan is here, because, you know, you've noticed at the beginning, like most females and males in a Bond movie, they're very attractive, <laughs> you know. Uh, oh, yeah. And, we, we get these very Aryan looking people <laughs> that, that show yeah. up. Uh huh. And it's like, no, this, you know, as we start to learn from this point on, you know, these are the astronauts. They're going to be going into space with yeah. Drax and this whole plan. It's like, no, he he wants to start a master race. It's like, yeah, again, tying into the Nazi origins of the villain from the book without straight up making him a Nazi, which I think yep. at this point, just do that. Right. Like, just tell us like that this dude was in the Nazi party. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, I yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I can't remember. I mean, have we seen James Bond battle Nazis? Not straight up, I don't think. No. Okay, that might be an interesting plot point to get to in future Bond movies. Um, but I love so he he says he, he says one of my favorite lines is uh, "You defy all my attempts to plan an amusing death for you. You're not a sportsman, Mister Bond." And he brings him into this another incredible Ken Adams set, this angular room of TV banks. Yeah, that I yeah, just, this is really cool. Like just Batman immediately, his his nipples on his suit get hard when he looks at this room. But like, <laughs> <laughs> this is the Batcave Batman always dreamed of. <laughs> yeah, right. He, he watched this movie and he's like, that guy's got some good ideas. But like, I love Richard Keel in this scene. He's watching these rockets lift off on the screens. And he's got this like kind of grin on his face. He's just sort of fascinated by all of it. And I think uh -huh. he's really, it's the first time that you consider maybe Jaws is a lot smarter than he's letting on, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, we get that turn from him here. Like that, this is what we've been alluding to. I mean, yeah. anybody who's seen the movie knows, but it's, you know, uh, Jaws finally realizes maybe I'm working for a bad dude. Maybe, I'm, <laughs> you know, well, it, I mean, in a bit, Drax will straight up say, Anybody that's not perfect, I don't want on my new planet. And Jaws, you know, is not considered traditionally beautiful and neither is his nearsighted girlfriend, you know. <laughs> uh, but before that, James gets taken to this conference room where Holly looks bored as shit. <laughs> this is the one thing I have to say is I'm, I'm glad she wasn't in a bikini. Yeah, for, oh, the, yeah. for once, our villain didn't like make her get into like a nighty or something. 
but I fucking love when they put him in this room and that, you know, uh, he's, oh, Bond must be cold from being in the water. Put him somewhere where he's bound to be warmer. Yeah, like, yeah. It, you know, and uh, you, you don't know it right away, but like, I love when this fucking desk just starts Fold going into the floor. It's great. I was like, wow, this is one of the coolest things I've seen so far. Yeah, yeah. But this, this, this conference room is built directly over the shuttle's launch. <laughs> yeah, which this is one of the few bits that's taken from the book. There is a scene where Bond and, and his partner are like in danger of being burned up by a rocket. And that's like one of the only things they kept from the book. So this is probably where he gives his coldest line delivery is when yeah. he's telling them, talking about, you know, you're going to meet your, 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 your end. You're going to be in, have a fiery death. I can't remember exactly what he says, but you know, I, unfortunately, like I didn't feel like any of the lines he delivered were enough to like, to to deem my ice cold line of the movie yeah i just don't i don't think the actor delivers it well and i it, it would either be here or when he sticks the dogs on the girl earlier but like again like nothing about his delivery of these these things has made me go oh that's fucking cold you know yeah not there, like not like in the other movies there is a line that he has coming up that i enjoy quite a bit but from his delivery but yeah i i find a lot of his stuff around here is very boilerplate, like, oh, Mr. Bond, you've arrived to, you know, you've arrived to die, essentially. Like, I'm going to burn you up. <laughs> uh, and he, he also comes across a lot like uh, um, Donald Pleasance's Blofeld a little bit. I sure. mean, he's definitely not being as cheeky as Donald Pleasance, but he never seems to blink. He's always just kind of got like this blank expression on his face. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the blackest <laughs> eyes, the devil's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> that dude played michael myers at one point he probably would have been a good it. one <laughs> uh so plas uh donald or uh donald pleasance <laughs> can you imagine uh donald pleasance is james bond um roger moore uses plastique uh that's in his watch they escape through the vent i like this whole little escape bit with the fire kind of like shooting up the vent uh um, yeah it was gi giving me aliens vibes oh bit. totally and I, and I love this silly little yellow buggy that they steal. Holly like wrecks one dude with a fuel canister. <laughs> Which uh, those those shots were apparently actually shot in mines that they had to you know, like on on location okay. in mines. Wow. Um, but uh, this is where like all the launches are starting to happen. All these people are starting to go into space. And then uh, it, it, it's reminiscent of those scenes in Dr. No, that are just a lot of characters being like, I'm flipping this switch now. And now I'm yeah. going to go over there. And I it's, it's broken up by, I think the shot of the shuttle leaving the atmosphere is really well done. The, the, the glittering mm -hmm. cities below and, Oh, Oh, and go ahead. that yeah. was another that was another cool thing I saw in the behind the scenes is how they had to achieve some of the shots of the shuttles, you know, lifting off and getting yeah. into space and whatnot. Um, you know, these are all, you know, small models that they're having to work with to do all this stuff. Yeah. And in one of the shots where they had to get the like the trails of the ship leaving the atmosphere, uh -huh. they filled it with salt and put holes in the bottom. So when the when the shuttle is going up on the string, it's salt you see falling out of it that causes the wow. trails. I nice. was like, that's pretty fucking creative. That's brilliant. Like, I was blown. Yeah. I was blown away by that. It, it all. I think honestly, I think all of the model work here looks really good. Um, there's a couple of shots where I'm like, especially once when when James and Holly are watching like the destruction through the window. Some of that is like very mm -hmm. clearly some rough rear projection stuff. But all of the in camera model work, I think, is really impressive. Well, one of my favorite shots in this movie is mm -hmm. the reveal of the space station. Yeah. Which they, they borrowed heavily from 2001. 100%. They, 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 they talk about that in the behind the scenes about how that was a big influence on what they were going for here. Definitely. Um, but I love that reveal. And they said it was just one shot, one, one spotlight on it. And they, it's just, it's an amazing shot it for looks a model. So good. Yeah. Um, um, and we get this really ominous scene where Bond checks the cargo hold and he sees all of these beautiful people in the back of the ship. Mm -hmm. And he yep. says to Holly, the animals went in two by two. Like he's, yeah. he's putting it together. Like this is the, the he's going to repopulate. And, but it is very, it's also very funny that everyone in that cargo hold 
is so fucking horny. Like they can't. Like, yeah, they're, dude. They're it's all like, making out. They're all like touching each other's like hair. Like <laughs> it's like it cuts away from that camera shot just in time so you don't see the orgy that's going uh, on. Right. Thing. But uh, uh, but I love the I love like sort of his his realization. I think Roger Moore plays that scene very well. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I I love the reveal that it's this whole like we're gonna we're gonna depopulate the earth and then we're gonna repopulate it with the beautiful right. people. It's a, it's it's another one of those like you know like I said Goldfinger moments where it's like this this is happening but not exactly what you thought was gonna right. happen. You know? Yeah, and yeah, this I've got right here the slow reveal. The spaceship is great, and uh, we get this really funny bit unintentionally funny but the first technician who hops out uh and goes to turn on the gravity he's walking like me after a night at karaoke like he is he's sort of just like <laughs> wobbling his way over to the desk he he floats up into the air um and i think maybe this is the time to talk about it i think the zero g stuff is really well done i get that they wanted to show it off there's a lot of it <laughs> In the space station, I'm on board. I think it all looks great. I think they did a great job. Yeah, yeah. However, when the Marines show up later and we have our in space flight battle, that's where I'm going to start having some, some issues. Here. Right. Like you said, they're having to hit these certain points with it being a Bond movie. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, okay, I understand we want to take this to space, guys, but having individuals in space firing laser guns at each other just doesn't seem like the right way to go it's it it a lot of it looks really good but it looks good but, but the, it, ha it has no business being in a james bond movie right it's just so silly like we've had silly in this movie but this is like the top of the tier silly and it's like this would not be happening <laughs> uh, they even they even yeah. say it in the behind the scenes they're like we had to figure out a way to blow something up in space where there <laughs> is no there Gravity. is no oxygen there would be no fire like guess how what? do we they, do this guess what they don't do it because they just blow shit up in space <laughs> like they just yeah. do that <laughs> well there are certain moments where they <laughs> they apparently after they were done shooting the model uh there's this the spot where everybody is like uh, evacuating and yeah. the ship is breaking up what they did is they took the model and went in with a shotgun and just shot shotgun that. rounds. I read that. <laughs> yeah, that's nuts. I was like, well, I guess that's the way you do it without fire. I love it. But no, I, I was like, I love that they get to show off this set, but it is a whole lot of people just kind of walking around for a little bit. I, I like Jaws and Dolly look stoked to be in space, but also I keep thinking, what does Dolly think of all of this? Why is she yeah, here? That was my thing. I was like, does she realize she kind of just joined a cult? Like this is not yeah, you, you <laughs> something to a, celebrate. A, a genocidal evil plan. Who are well, you, she's, Dolly? <laughs> she's so blinded by love for Jaws that she's just like, okay, <laughs> I get it. And we get uh, a great, we get a great villain speech. Uh, first there was a dream. Now there is reality. Here in the untainted cradle of the heavens will be created a new super race. And it's great, but it's also... It reminded me of the bit in Glenn or Glenda or Ed Wood whenever Bela Lugosi is just like, I pulled a string! You know, like, I will create a new race of super beings! Like, it's... I was just getting like General Zod vibes off of sure, all this. Totally. It was like, oh, okay, another it, reference to Superman there. It does cut to when he says perfect physical specimens. It cuts to Jaws sort of going like, the fuck are you talking about? Like, it's like the look <laughs> on his face. It's so funny. But I, when shit starts hitting the, well, <laughs> here we go. This is, okay, so we, they can't see the space station because there is a cloaking a device. Radar jammer. Or, yeah. the, the radar jammer. The radar jammer. Instantly, again, another Spaceballs reference is like, Radar is about to be jammed. jammed. <laughs> uh, but, like, this is all just so silly in, yeah. in, in watching this for me. It's just like, oh, they can't see us. Well, we didn't see any radar jamming stuff. Uh, let's walk this way and see if we find Yeah, it, it might be over that way. Yeah, she, she, yeah. Says, she says something to the effect of like, I think I saw a room when we came in. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> but it's just uh, the happenstance of how they find all of this, like, I, I, I get it. You're a knowledgeable spy. Like, right. you know how to do a lot of things. But it's like, when you get to the point where it's like, these guys are just 
flying space shuttles with no like no no problem mm -hmm. uh, you're you're firing lasers at shit within the atmosphere uh like this is all the goofiness it's like you kind of might have went a little overboard with it in this movie and it but it, it, it's such a like to your point from earlier we only really get to space in the last 20 minutes of the film and mm -hmm. and that's that's why it feels like an overload it, it is yep. It's so much. So all of a sudden we are fully in a Star Trek uh, act three, you know, people yeah. are firing laser rifles. People are, you know, blowing up a space station. Um, but we do get some stuff that sort of grounds us. I love the scenes of whenever they, whenever they knock the radar jammer out, all this various superpowers reacting to the sudden appearance of a space station, including mm -hmm. the return of general Gogol uh, yeah, <laughs> which was a fun little bit. Uh, I did read originally he was the woman he was meant to be in bed with was Agent Triple X from the previous film. It would have been a cameo appearance and she was unavailable, uh, which would have been very funny to me. Like, I, I just I, I'm like, what is your deal, Anya? <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's uh, a good bit. Yeah, I, I like to see him, you know, it, it was funny, like, like, I was expecting that scene to end, and then it just keeps going with the woman in the bed. I was like, oh, damn. It, it's very uh, Karen Bay from, uh, from Russia with yeah. Lobby, very back to the salt mines. I, <laughs> what does he say? He's like, just problems, problems. <laughs> it's like, I don't sleep, nothing but problems. It's so funny. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah. But, you know. And the implication is, so he's talking to Colonel Scott, uh, of the u.s military in that scene like if you don't uh figure this out soon we're going russia is going to see this as an act of aggression yeah and you've got 12 hours to get this shit right or you know. five minutes after this colonel scott's in space <laughs> like he's he, he didn't even send other people like colonel scott is on a <laughs> shuttle to moonraker it is so funny uh it, it, yeah like i don't know how they would have done more space stuff because honestly like how much can you really be right. in space i mean this is really what they do in this movie is about what you could expect to do uh especially when you're in a, a movie franchise that is built on like all of this travel and world building uh like uh, uh travel log stuff as you as you call it like but also at this point in the series chasing trends right in the roger moore era we've had a black exploitation film we've had a chop sake you know martial arts film and now yeah. we're in space we're doing star crash you know <laughs> <laughs> and it's you know i can understand following the trends but sometimes I, I think we get lost in that, especially especially in the business sense of like movie making and whatnot. It's like, oh, this is hot right now, so we've got to go there. Yeah, and you, you don't really like. No, uh, th and, there's and always going to be peaks and valleys for your for your IP, and it's just like when you go to space, like that's the thing. Is like everything is like, oh, when are they going to when? When is the Fast and Furious going to space? They fucking did it, you yeah. know. It, it, when you reach the point where you've got to take your franchise to space, you've got a question like, okay, how does this <laughs> is, fit what we're doing? Do we think, do we, and you know what? I'm going to throw this out there. I think the only franchise that has successfully done it is Jason X because that movie <laughs> that truly, I think that movie is very aware of what it is at all times. And it still plays with the tropes of its franchise. This movie feels like we have thrown bond into space. Let's see if it works yeah yeah and i mean we've had our little dips into the space stuff there's sure. one of the uh, one of the sean connery ones i don't remember which one starts out in space yeah yeah um, uh, thunderball yeah thunderball and um it's like you know we this isn't this isn't territory we haven't sure. you know went to in some capacity sure. but it's like we're finally going to put bond in that spot and we and, are going to hand him a blaster that han solo would have exactly um, and, yeah. it, it, you know, I could see this, you know, I could see this as a Batman 66 episode for totally. sure. Like, yeah, I, uh, but like having Bond in space gets a little jokey and yeah. especially with Goodhead just sort of like tagging along for the ride. I mean, she she serves a purpose. She's very good at flying a spaceship. She's not. Be oh, well, no, she is in a minute. That's right. But whenever they first get up there, she's like, it, this is on autopilot, which is very helpful. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, no, you're right. Um, we do around here, though, I feel like this is when all of a sudden Michael Lonsdale comes alive. 
Like he's giving big speeches. He has I, my favorite line delivery of his is when he kind of does a little chuckle in the middle of James Bond, you appear with the tedious inevitability of an unloved season, which is like such a wilting <laughs> line to say. I, I love that he describes his array, uh, his weapons array as a necklace of death above the earth. Um, I did think that was cool. I did like that line. And then I'm going to put this up as our stone cold line of the film. Uh, when he opens up the uh, airlock, he says, Dr. Goodhead, your desire to be America's first woman in space will shortly be fulfilled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. OK, you've got the ice cold line. You covered it. <laughs> that, that's a good one. But he basically uh, we, says, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no. I, we've had better ones, but that, yeah, that it's is not, definitely it's a good not one. my fave. But yeah, he 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 basically says, yeah, Jaws. People like Jaws are going to be uh, allowed in my new world. I'm going to repopulate the Earth once I kill everyone on the planet. And how, so we've kind of teased around it. How do you feel about Jaws's hero turn here, where he just kind of starts going sick house on these bad guys? Well, I, obviously, it serves a purpose in the movie. It's 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 good that Bond has that ally because John. Yeah. I mean, uh, Jaws starts, you know, handing people their asses and tossing dudes around this space station. Uh, yeah, Bond but, and Holly are doing judo throws, and Jaws is just picking up dudes and bodying them, <laughs> body slamming people in space. Um, I, you know, it almost now knowing that everybody loved Jaws and like wanted to see him not be a bad guy, it almost feels like sort of a fan service that they sure. turned him into a good guy. But I mean, it, it works for this movie. I don't know if I'm crazy about it. Um, I, I mean, the, the biggest thing I like about it is I like to see, I, I like the fact that I see jaws and Dolly sort of like have a happily ever after in the end. Yeah. But, but you know, the whole thing with them trying to launch the shuttle, uh, the, the Moonraker five and they yeah. can't get away and they have jaws help with that. Um, I don't know. Like uh, it works in the movie, but I'm not it feels crazy like a bit about much. it. Yeah. Yeah. What I think is really funny is that when James is like, can you help us? We can't disengage. Dolly whispers something to Jaws, which helps him figure out how to really. And I'm like, how the fuck does Dolly know how the spaceship is constructed? <laughs> you just joined this cult like a day ago. How do you know anything? Again, like he he helps them by just like pulling a pipe out of a, a thing. Yeah. Like there's, yeah. there's not really much explanation for what he does, but it's 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 pretty silly. Yeah. And honestly, I was sort of just like, oh, are they really just gonna like let him and Dolly float out into space? And that's gonna be it their. It sure seems that way, doesn't it? But uh, you know, but John uh, John uh, Bond makes the comment. He's like, oh, they'll be fine. They'll hit Earth's atmosphere and earth's only a, oh no that's what he says earth's only a hundred miles away <laughs> it's only a hundred miles to earth and i wrote down the moon is two hundred and thirty eight thousand nine hundred miles away <laughs> but uh yeah no i and then one of the yeah one of the guys on the ground says uh we've we've recovered some survivors a blonde woman and a tall man or something like that yeah um and and you know i from what I understand that this is the last time we will see Jaws. But again, it was just one of those things where I was like, oh, they're keeping Jaws around for mm -hmm. future future spotlight. But, you know, we'll we'll see. I don't think he shows up again, but he does um, get the uh, you know, he does get his one line. Well, here's to us, which is kind of sweet. Uh, he pops the cork with his mouth and pours champagne. <laughs> Although I mean, that's it's not a flattering look when he does that, though. I, no. I, I get the, I that get was the almost my background for. for this episode. And I was like, <laughs> uh, I, I do love my, my the thing that I love about this final sequence is. Normally, I'd be a little annoyed at how perfunctory the final showdown is between Bond and Drax, but I mm -hmm. love the shots of more walking down the corridor while sparks are flying behind him. And the ship is the shots of the walls buckling from the inside are really good. Yes. And, I, I like, I like how you kind of see them yeah. ripple. Like it's, it's yeah. a really cool way they, they display this space station coming apart from the inside. Yeah. Uh, which you don't normally see a whole lot. And we get Bond's one truly great one liner. I will argue this is a great one liner when he shoots Drax in the heart with the dart opens the airlock and says, take a giant step for mankind <laughs> and blows him out of the space. I, I love you, it. <laughs> I thought you were going to say when Goodhead shows up and asks where he is, he's like, 
he had to fly. Like I was like, yeah. oh god, no, that's bad. that one's lazy. Yeah, <laughs> that one's so bad. Uh, but that's, that's and, up there. You know, Schwarzenegger and a racer. Like he had to catch a train. Like it's just sort of like whatever. <laughs> who fucking cares? Uh, he had to catch a train, but but he had to split is a great one. Like, he had to split is he, so good. It can't. Yeah, absolutely. But now Bond and Goodhead have got to figure out how they got to get back to Earth. They've right. also got to stop the three globes that have been sent out from from causing you know death and destruction on Earth. Luckily, it's very easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They shoot. Uh, you know. Yeah, I, it's. I don't know. Like they're. I don't. It's not like I feel like they're not going to succeed at this. Uh-huh. And the sequence just takes a really long time for them to shoot these three globes it's out just, of the sky. Yeah, there's not a ton of tension. It's Bond essentially playing a video game for a little bit. I, you know, he's, he's I mean, it, you know, they go to Star from, Wars. Yeah. Yeah, they go to Star Wars and it's basically the Death Star running. Let's stay on target. You know, it's Up just... to and including Bond being like, I have to go manual. Like he turns off the automatic, pulls out the joystick, starts playing around a Xevious like and it's just it's like whatever he he blows up the he blows up the orbs and we (laughs) now here's the thing it's like if you thought you're gonna get away in a bond movie without some zero g sex going on no you're not (laughs) we we finally don't end one with them like you know in a raft which is nice uh right get another we get another raftless or boatless ending but it is bond yeah, Bond. I, I do like the shots of the uh, their headsets floating, but yeah, um, yeah, those are good. We cut back to the war room. Uh, Frederick Gray, <laughs> M, uh, Q were all there, and it, it, to <laughs> add to add to the the hilarity of it, uh, to celebrate the cooperation between the United States military and Great Britain, they're they're broadcasting what we're about to see in the White House and Buckingham Palace. <laughs> This is why you definitely have a delay feed. <laughs> <It's> right. Like... <laughs> and I, I kind of love when Bond notices the camera, though, and he's just like, he kind of gives you the wink. Uh... <laughs> Here we get my favorite line of the movie, which is Desmond, Desmond Llewellyn. He delivers this one very well. So it's funny because he's not looking at the screen. He does not know that everyone's watching Bond fuck on camera. I love him right. saying 007. Like, and, and, they're like, what is he doing? And Q's looking at the radar and he goes, I believe he's attempting reentry, sir. <laughs> so stupid. It's the perfect uh, ending to the movie. Yeah, for, for this movie, it's definitely <laughs> <For> this <laughs> the perfect movie. way to end it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but then and you get the, you know, you get a hat on a hat with good head. Oh, take me around the world one more time, James. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, it's, and James says, why not? Like, he doesn't even care. <laughs> He doesn't care. The movie's over. We're in space. I've got nothing better to do. You know, Truly, we're running out of oxygen. <laughs> We've got to give each other mouth to mouth. It works, James. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I don't know. As I said in the beginning, <laughs> it, it is not. It's not a movie that I would walk away saying I hated. Sure. But it's definitely not one of the better bond movies no nah. definitely not i mean it, it is stupid it is stupid <laughs> in a very charming way uh and in i think that's why charming way yeah yeah i think that's why i can give it a pass is because it's 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 stupid for the right stupid like i, <laughs> I gotta say i'm having a better time talking about it than i did watching it i i find this movie to be a bit of a slog which you you like you don't expect Bond in space to be particularly good, right? But you also right. don't expect it to be boring for long stretches. And I find this movie to be pretty boring and by the numbers for big stretches of it. It's one that I I don't revisit very often. Yeah, that that would be my biggest takeaway from this one is I, I, I have a lot of there's a lot of downtime in yeah. this movie where I'm not. You know, the the story isn't compelling me enough to be interested and the action sequences are not very exciting. Right. So you get a lot of this time where you're just watching characters go through motions. And while they're trying to make jokes in that, some of them will hit with you and some of them won't. But right. the majority of it, it's just it's just really silly and stupid. Yeah. Um, And 
it, again, that blows me away that this movie made $230 million at the box office. In the summer of 1979, Moonraker smashes box office records around the globe. James Bond once again proves that no challenge, not even outer space, is too big for 007. Take me around the world one more time. I was just about to say this movie obliterated. It, it made a lot of money, but... It was not particularly well liked. Uh, you know, uh, fans more or less sort of retreated from this one. And yeah. there was this feeling of we went too expensive and we went too silly. So we got to pull things back for the next entry. We, we really got to go back to basics in a big way. I, I would say like Joel Schumacher's Batman stuff sort of suffered, suffered from the same thing. Yeah. Here. It's like, you know, he he took over the Batman series and kind of took it in a direction that was a lot sillier and goofier than we than we got in, in Burton's Batman. Yeah, definitely. Um, and while those movies <laughs> have their, their their good moments, like they're not particularly great movies. Right. They're fun I, movies. I'm still that, I, I still challenge you to bring me on to VHS files to talk about Batman and Robin, because I think I might turn you around on it. <laughs> <laughs> well i i've been qu in quite an arnold schwarzenegger like uh ditch here lately Dude, like uh, me I'm, too yeah i, I i've Weird been that. <laughs> i've been like in a schwarzenegger like vacuum here lately yeah yeah and it, it makes me kind of want to go back and watch his performance in that can i tell uh, you as total tangent that man made a million dollars per minute of screen time for batman and robin I believe it, man. I mean, his paycheck for Terminator Three was was unheard of at the Hilarious. time when Rise of the Machines came out. Yeah, and like not only his butt, like his his paycheck was a certain amount. They gave him like a, a particular like workout trailer on set, a special trailer. Like he also there got was like, merchandising so much... stuff out of that too. Yeah, yeah, he got he 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 paid twenty percent of all the merch sales on that. Crazy, which I don't think the merch did quite that well on that one, but. <laughs> Uh, no, we, we, all, we all have like five Nick Stahl action figures at home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, like I think this is kind of like Moonraker, I would say, is sort of in that in that area of the Joel Schumacher Batman's. Yeah, me, right? I could see that. Totally. I, I would never say that they're my favorite in the series. Yeah, but I enjoy watching them. I can sure. have fun watching them. I think that some of the decisions that were made were a little questionable and <laughs> sure. maybe maybe not as funny as they thought they were at the time. But, you know, like you said, the, the, even the worst Bond movie is still got some sort of you can still have a good time with it. Yeah, you know, definitely. And, and, especially, and even even after us talking about it, like I said, like I have a different respect for some of the choices that were made in it. <laughs> sure. So uh, I, I, you know, I don't know if I'll be rewatching this one again anytime soon, but I wouldn't say I'd never rewatch it again. Like it, it'd be one of those movies where, like, if you were in town and be like, Nathan, let's let's watch Moonraker. Let's, let's watch on Moonraker. Let's burn one and throw on Moonraker. <laughs> uh, which, you know, if 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 our future plans go the way we hope, so yeah. I hope they're gonna go. Um, we'll, we'll probably be be revisiting Moonraker in the future, but. Uh, more on that later down the line. Speaking of future plans, Josh, uh, the next time we come back, we're going to be covering the the namesake, the, the, the title film for our show. Yeah. Uh, for, for your eyes only. If you had to guess what the plot of that movie is, what would you say? Man, I racked my brain trying to come up with something clever uh -huh. and just nothing came to mind. I'm at a loss as to where this is going to go. I have heard that there was some repercussions to the reception of Moonraker. Yeah. And they, they decided they needed to go back to basics again. Um, so I'm hoping it's going to be a, a much better, like, spy espionage story uh -huh. with some interesting character moments in it. Okay. That's, that's what I'm hoping for. Out of For Your Eyes Only. I guess we'll have to see, man. Uh, but I got to tell you, I'm very excited to to watch this. I mean, your you. excitement for wanting to see, that, wanting to talk about this one has me excited to get to it. Awesome. And uh, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, 
Partly because I'm one step closer to Octopussy, which I'm really looking You're just like, to. what the fuck is that movie? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got I got to know <laughs> what's up with Octopussy. One step so, closer to Octopussy and uh, a movie that maybe the the viewers aren't expecting us to cover. Uh, yeah, it, we, so we'll, we, we'll talk about it. We might be talking about an old Bond uh, in a future episode. An, an so. old Bond in more ways than one. In more uh, ways than one. <laughs> uh, Josh, before we skedaddle, do you have anything yeah. to plug today? Uh, VHS Files, back in action. We've yeah. got some new episodes out on the YouTube, so please check out the feed for those. Love it. Uh, Eric and I just discussed The Beyond, uh, our first Lucio Fulci movie. Yeah. So uh, we talk about that one, and uh, it'll be coming out at the end of... Well, it'll be out by the time this comes out, so check that out. Yeah. And um, what will also be out by the time this episode is released is I have a new channel that has... Uh, that I have been developing and my good friend Nathan here on the show is going to be helping out with that. Yeah. Um, we have a new channel called body bags that we're going to be releasing to the public. Um, if you're fans of dead meat and the kill count, you will probably love what we're doing here. Um, action movies, thrillers, dramas, any of that stuff that you've been itching to know what the kills are in those <laughs> movies, we're going to supply that. For yeah. You. So, body bags uh will officially be out when this episode drops so please uh we are going to be working really hard on making some very entertaining videos <laughs> uh just highlighting the kills and some of our favorite just cheesy action movies all that stuff and also some uh, classics and some classics i mean we're starting out with the terminator franchise yeah. so if you want to know how many people die in the Terminator movies, we will, we've got you covered <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going, we're going balls to the wall after that. We've mm -hmm. got plans for a lot of different stuff. We're going to be tackling a few franchises and uh, some surprises here and there. So if that sounds interesting to you, uh, can tune into body bags. Yeah. And we, we are, we are really excited. We're, we're going to have some fun with this one. And, you know, this podcast was sort of a genesis of where we're going to go with that. Terminator like, uh, genesis, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> so if uh, you enjoy hearing us talking about Bond in this podcast, yeah, uh, we may be talking about Bond in that capacity in the future. So be looking forward to that. I've uh, seen the first couple of these and I'm so stoked to uh, to, to join the, the crew and, and work on these with you, man. Like, I'm so yeah. stoked for people to see it. Yeah, Nathan is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to movies <laughs> and pop culture. And memes, so mostly <laughs> memes. Uh, he's uh, he's definitely going to be helping me out with some of some of the background and, mm -hmm. and things of that nature in those episodes. So, uh, you know, I think me and you make a pretty good team when it comes to talking about movies and making some jokes. Totally. So, yeah, uh, I'm super excited to see where we can go with this. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited. Really excited. Same. Um, but how about you? Do you have anything to plug? I know you got a ton of stuff. Going I never on. stop. Uh, so <laughs> when this episode drops, we'll be coming in for a landing uh, pretty soon on the seventh season of the VH or not the VHS files. That's your show. <laughs> the seventh season of the Silver Linings playlist, uh, the podcast yeah. I do with my buddies Dustin and Mally. Uh, since we recorded the Spy Who Loved Me episode, Josh has been on to talk about Nightmare on Elm Street Three: Dream Warriors with us on that. Mm -hmm show a very fun episode um so we're we're coming in on a coming into a close on this season not a hundred percent sure yet what our season finale episode is going to be because we're gonna uh we're gonna get we're gonna figure that out on air that's gonna be a little tease for the uh for the finale <laughs> knowing you guys that's gonna be an interesting uh yeah. <laughs> d d I, deliberation I, I, it was my idea and i regret it uh so <laughs> so there's that <laughs> and uh so we've got that going on. Uh, the AIPT Comics podcast is soldiering on. We recently celebrated, well, a couple months ago, we celebrated our 250th episode. And we had 
the one and only Kevin Smith on the podcast as our guest. Uh, I, dude, I, like you have no idea how jealous I am of it, you for that. Like Kevin is one of my heroes. It's dude. nuts. I still can't and, believe this happened. Um, yeah, we we j- we we had Kevin on to talk about. I call him Kevin. Uh, we had Kevin on. <laughs> we're, we're on a first name basis. We're, we're now. best friends. Uh, we had him on for like an hour and a half long interview. He was an absolute prince and uh, just answered all of our questions about his new quick stops comic book series and his super dark fucked up superhero series masquerade which started uh, per, uh started life as a question tv series he was gonna do a tv series based on the question from dc comics uh we get into all of that in the conversation it's really fun um we've had some really great guests recently uh see by the time this episode airs we'll have talked to um Uh, We've got Declan Shalvey and Drew Moss coming on to talk about the new Thundercats uh, comic book series, which fans of the VHS files might be stoked about. Um, We've uh, we just recently talked to Amy Jo Johnson, the original Pink Power Ranger, about her (laughs) Power Rangers uh, comic book series. That's that's coming out. I'm sure I'm sure some of your teenage feelings came out of that interview. We only had like 10 minutes with her because it was like a press junket and it took everything in me to not just go off on tangents because I I lived and breathed Power Rangers when I was a kid. Uh, But yeah, there's there's so much fun stuff, lots of nostalgic callbacks, stuff that fans of the vhs files would really appreciate and then also we, we just have cr- different creators on pretty much every week to talk about their craft uh and also <laughs> we i have uh, oh that's a scary movie the podcast that i do with my fiance ashley uh where we talk about horror films uh we recently celebrated valentine's day by recording an episode on the original twilight <laughs> <laughs> which uh we it was very different from our usual episodes because we drank a bottle of wine watched the movie refused to take notes and then just talked about our thoughts immediately afterwards uh very fun that's episode an, that's an interesting experiment um and uh, we've got some really fun stuff coming up where we're going to be talking about uh the intruder a 1989 slasher film directed by scott spiegel we've got uh we've got episodes planned for the blair witch project which is celebrating its 25th anniversary and uh possibly revisiting the scream franchise very soon uh, for another episode on that so uh, uh, yeah a lot of lot of a uh, lot of nostalgic faves this season for sure nice nice well i mean you can find all of nathan's stuff on your podcast platform yeah. silver linings playlist oh that's a scary movie uh what's the comic one again aipt I- comics podcast. aipt comics i'm so terrible with names You're, if you go to aipt comics.com you can also read uh reviews that i that i write for the site uh, every once in a while i've been reviewing the new uh john constantine hellblazer series from uh, dc comics which is unbelievable nice nice all right well that'll do it for our coverage of moonraker yeah uh, it was a fun conversation we were happy to get on and talk about it i, I had a blast man man like, me too again again like even if it's a bad one it's still a fun conversation and that's that's <laughs> totally. that's the beauty of doing this show so we'll be back next month hopefully <laughs> as long as life doesn't get in the way again we'll be back to talk about our namesake for your eyes only That's and right. you'll see what That's my big first one. time reaction is for this one so yeah. i'm excited excited but until then nathan stay shaken never stirred